Part 1, Scene 1 of The Dance of Death by August Stringberg Translated by Edward Bjorkman The scene is laid inside of a round fort built of granite. In the background, a gateway, closed by huge swinging double doors. In these, small square window panes, through which may be seen a seashore with batteries and the sea beyond. On either side of the gateway, a window with flower pots and bird cages. To the right of the gateway, an upright piano. Further down the stage, a sewing table and two easy chairs. On the left, halfway down the stage, a writing table with a telegraph instrument on it. Further down, a whatnot full of framed photographs. Beside it, a couch that can be used to sleep on. Against the wall, a buffet. A lamp suspended from the ceiling. On the wall near the piano hang two large laurel wreaths with ribbons. Between them, the picture of a woman in stage dress. Beside the door, a hat stand on which hang accoutrements, sabers, and so forth. Near it, a chiffonier. To the left of the gateway hangs a mercurial barometer. It is a mild fall evening. The doors stand open, and a sentry is seen pacing back and forth on the shore battery. He wears a helmet with a forward-pointed brush for a crest. Now and then his drawn saber catches the red glare of the setting sun. The sea lies dark and quiet. The captain sits in the easy chair to the left of the sewing table, fumbling an extinguished cigar. He has a much worn undress uniform and riding boots with spurs, looks tired and bored. Alice sits in the easy chair on the right, doing nothing at all, looks tired and expectant. Won't you play something for me? What am I to play? Whatever suits you. You don't like my repertory. Nor you mine. Do you want the doors to stay open? If you wish it. Let them be, then. Why don't you smoke? Strong tobacco is beginning not to agree with me. Get weaker tobacco, then. It is your only pleasure, as you call it. Pleasure? What is that? Don't ask me. I know it as little as you. Don't you want your whiskey yet? I'll wait a little. What have you for supper? How do I know? Ask Christine. The mackerel ought to be in season soon, now the fall is here. Yes, it is fall. Within and without. But leaving aside the cold that comes with the fall, both within and without, a little broiled mackerel with a slice of lemon and a glass of white burgundy wouldn't be so very bad. Now you grow eloquent. Have we any burgundy left in the wine cellar? So far as I know, we have had no wine cellar these last five years. You never know anything. However, we must stock up for our silver wedding. Do you actually mean to celebrate it? Of course. It would be more seemly to hide our misery. Our twenty-five years of misery. My dear Alice, it has been a misery. But we have also had some fun, now and then. One has to avail oneself of what little time there is, for afterward it is all over. Is it over? Would that it were. It is over. Nothing left but what can be put on a wheelbarrow and spread on the garden beds. And so much trouble for the sake of the garden beds. Well, that's the way of it. And it is not of my making. So much trouble. Did the mail come? Yes. Did the butcher send his bill? Yes. How large is it? Captain takes a paper from his pocket and puts it on his spectacles, but takes them off again at once. Look at it yourself. I cannot see any longer. What is wrong with your eyes? I don't know. Growing old? Nonsense. I? Well, not I. Mm. Alice, looking at the bill. Can you pay it? Mm, yes, but not this moment. Some other time, of course. In a year when you have been retired with a small pension, and it is too late. And then when your trouble returns. Trouble? I never had any trouble. Only a slight indisposition, once. And I can live another twenty years. The doctor thought otherwise. The doctor? Yes. Who else could express any valid opinion about sickness? 
I have no sickness, and never had. I am not going to have it either, for I shall die all of a sudden, like an old soldier. Speaking of the doctor, you know they are having a party tonight. Yes, what of it? We are not invited, because we don't associate with those people, and we don't associate with them because we don't want to, because we despise both of them. Rabble, that's what they are. You say that of everybody. Because everybody is rabble. Except yourself. Yes, because I have behaved decently under all conditions of life. That's why I don't belong to the rabble. Do you want to play cards? Oh, all right. Alice takes a pack of cards from the drawer in the sewing table and begins to shuffle them. Just think. The doctor is permitted to use the band for a private entertainment. That's because he goes to the city and truckles to the colonel. Truckle, you know. If one could only do that. Alice deals. I used to be friendly with Gerda. But she played me false. They are all false. What did you turn up for trumps? Put on your spectacles. They are no help. Well, well? Spades or trumps. Spades? Alice leads. Well, be that as it may. Our case is settled in advance with the wives of the new officers. Captain, taking the trick. What does it matter? We never give any parties anyhow, so nobody is the wiser. I can live by myself, as I have always done. I, too. But the children? The children have to grow up without any companionship. Let them find it for themselves in the city. I take that. Got any trumps left? One. That's mine. Six and eight make fifteen. Fourteen. Fourteen. Uh, six and eight make fourteen. I think I am also forgetting how to count. And two make sixteen. It is your deal. Uh. You are tired. Captain Dealing. Uh, not at all. Alice listening in the direction of the open doors. One can hear the music all this way. Do you think Kurt is invited also? He arrived this morning, so I guess he has had time to get out his evening clothes, though he has not had time to call on us. Master of Quarantine. Is there to be a quarantine station here? Yes, yes. He is my own cousin, after all, and once I bore the same name as he. In which there was no particular honor. See here. You leave my family alone, and I'll leave yours. All right, all right. Don't let us begin again. Must the master of quarantine be a physician? Oh, no. He's merely a sort of superintendent, a bookkeeper, and Kurt never became anything in particular. He was not much good. And he has cost us a lot of money. And when he left wife and children, he became disgraced. Not quite so severe, Edgar. That's what happened. What has he been doing in America since then? Well, I cannot say that I am longing for him, but he was a nice chap, and I like to argue with him. Because he was so tractable. Tractable or not, he was at least a man one could talk to. Here, on this island, there is not one person who understands what I say. It's a community of idiots. It is rather strange that Kurt should arrive just in time for our silver wedding, whether we celebrate it or not. Why is that strange? Oh, I see. It was he who brought us together, or got you married, as they put it. Well, didn't he? Certainly. It was a kind of fixed idea with him. I leave it to you to say what kind. A wanton fancy. For which we have had to pay, and not he. Yes. Think only if I had remained on the stage. All my friends are stars now. Captain Rising. Well, well, well. 
Now I am going to have a drink. Goes over to the buffet and mixes a drink, which he takes standing up. There should be a rail here to put the foot on, so that one might dream of being at Copenhagen in the American bar. Let us put a rail there, if it will only remind us of Copenhagen, for there we spent our best moments. Captain drinks quickly. Yes. Do you remember that Navarano poem? No, but I remember the concerts at the Tivoli. Yes, your tastes are so exalted. It ought to please you to have a wife whose taste is good. So it does. Sometimes when you need something to brag of. I guess there must be dancing at the doctor's. I catch the three-four time of the tuba. Boom, boom, boom. I can hear the entire melody of the Alcazar waltz. Well, it was not yesterday I danced a waltz. You think you could still manage? Still? Yes. I guess you are done with dancing, you like me. I am ten years younger than you. Then we are of the same age, as the lady should be ten years younger. Be ashamed of yourself. You are an old man, and I am still in my best years. Oh, I know, you can be quite charming to others when you make up your mind to it. Can we light the lamp now? Certainly. Will you ring, please? The captain goes languidly to the writing table and rings a bell. Jenny enters from the right. Will you be kind enough to light the lamp, Jenny? I want you to light the hanging lamp. Yes, ma'am. Jenny lights the lamp while the captain watches her. Did you wipe the chimney? Sure. What kind of an answer is that? Now, now. Leave us. I will light the lamp myself. That will be better. I think so, too. Jenny starts for the door. Alice rising. Go. Jenny stops. I wonder, ma'am, what you'd say if I did go. Alice remains silent. Jenny goes out. The captain comes forward and lights the lamp. Do you think she will go? Shouldn't wonder. And then we are in for it. It's your fault. You spoil them. Not at all. Can't you see that they are always polite to me? Because you cringe to them. And you always cringe to inferiors, for that matter. Because, like all despots, you have the nature of a slave. There, there. Yes, you cringe before your men and before your sergeants. But you cannot get on with your equals or your superiors. Ah. That's the way of all tyrants. Do you think she will go? Yes, if you don't go out and say something nice to her. I? Yes, for if I should do it, you would say that I was flirting with the maids. Oh, mercy if she should leave. Then I shall have to do the work, as I did the last time, and my hands will be spoiled. That is not the worst of it. But if Jenny leaves, Christine will also leave, and then we shall never get a servant to the island again. The mate on the steamer scares away every one that comes to look for a place, and if he should miss his chance, then my corporals attend to it. Yes, your corporals, whom I have to feed in my kitchen, and whom you dare not show the door. No, for then they would also go when their terms were up and we might have to close up the whole gun-shop. It'll be our ruin. That's why the officers have proposed to petition His Royal Majesty for special expense money. For whom? For the corporals. <laughs> you are crazy. Yes, laugh a little for me. I need it. I shall soon have forgotten how to laugh. Captain lighting his cigar. That is something one should never forget. It is tedious enough anyhow. Well, it is not very amusing. Do you want to play any more? No, it tires me. Do you know it irritates me, nevertheless, that my cousin, the new master of quarantine, makes his first visit to our enemies? Well, what's the use of talking about it? But did you see in the paper that he was put down as rentier? He must have come into some money, then. Rentier? Well, well, a rich relative. That's really the first one in this family. In your family, yes. But among my people, many have been rich. 
If he has money, he's conceited, I suppose. But I'll hold him in check, and he won't get a chance to look at my cards. The telegraph receiver begins to click. Who is it? Captain standing still. Keep quiet, please. Well, are you not going to look? I can hear. I can hear what they are saying. It's the children. Captain goes over to the instrument and sends an answer. The receiver continues to click for a while, and then the captain answers again. Well? Wait a little. Gives a final click. The children are at the guardhouse in the city. Judith is not well again and is staying away from school. Oh, again? What more did they say? Money, of course. Why is Judith in such a hurry? If she didn't pass her examinations until next year, it would be just as well. Tell her and see what it helps. You should tell her. How many times have I not done so? But children have their own wills, you know. Yes, in this house at least. The captain yawns. So you yawn in your wife's presence. Well, what can I do? Don't you notice how day by day we are saying the same things to each other? When, just now, you sprang that good old phrase of yours, in this house at least, I should have come back with my own standby. It's not my house only. But, as I have already made that reply some five hundred times, I yawned instead. And my yawn could be taken to me neither that I was too lazy to answer, or, right you are, my angel, or, supposing we quit. You are very amiable tonight. Is it not time for supper soon? Do you know that the doctor ordered supper from the city, from the Grand Hotel? No. Then they are having ptarmigans. Ugh. Ptarmigan, you know, is the finest bird there is, but it's clear barbarism to fry it in bacon grease. Ugh, don't talk of food. Well, how about wines? I wonder what those barbarians are drinking with the ptarmigans. Do you want me to play for you? Captain sits down at the writing table. Well, if you could only leave your dirges and lamentations alone. It sounds too much like music with a moral, and I am always adding within myself, Can't you hear how unhappy I am? Meow, meow. Can't you hear what a horrible husband I have? Broom, broom, broom. If he would only die soon. Beating of the joyful drum flourishes the finale of the Alcazar waltz champagne gallop. Speaking of champagne, I guess there are a couple of bottles left. What would you say about bringing them up and pretending to have company? No, we won't, for they are mine. They were given to me personally. You are so economical. And you are always stingy. To your wife, at least. Then I don't know what to suggest. Perhaps I might dance for you. No, thank you. I guess you are done with dancing. You should bring some friend to stay with you. Thanks. You might bring a friend to stay with you. Thanks. It has been tried, and with mutual dissatisfaction. But it was interesting in the way of an experiment, for as soon as a stranger entered the house we became quite happy, to begin with. And then? Oh, don't talk of it. There is a knock at the door on the left. Who can be coming so late as this? Jenny does not knock. Go and open the door, and don't yell, Come! It has a sound of the workshop. Captain goes toward the door on the left. You don't like workshops. Please open. Captain opens the door and receives a visiting card that is held out to him. It is Christine. Has Jenny left? As the public cannot hear the answer, to Alice. Jenny has left. Oh, then I become servant girl again. And I, man of all work. Would it not be possible to get one of your gunners to help along in the kitchen? Not these days. But it couldn't be Jenny who sent in her card. Captain looks at the card through his spectacles and then turns it over to Alice. You see what it is. I cannot. Alice looks at the card. Kurt! It is Kurt! Hurry up and bring him in. 
Captain goes out to the left. Kurt! Well, that's a pleasure. Alice arranges her hair and seems to come to life. Captain enters from the left with Kurt. Here he is, the traitor. Welcome, old man. Let me hug you. Alice goes to Kurt. Welcome to my home, Kurt. Thank you. It is some time since we saw each other. How long? Fifteen years. And we have grown old. No, Kurt has not changed, it seems to me. Sit down, sit down. And first of all, the program. Have you any engagement for tonight? I am invited to the doctors, but I have not promised to go. Then you will stay with your relatives. That would seem the natural thing, but the doctor is my superior, and I might have trouble afterward. What kind of talk is that? I have never been afraid of my superiors. Fear or no fear, the trouble cannot be escaped. On this island I am master. Keep behind my back, and nobody will dare to touch you. Oh, be quiet, Edgar. Takes Kurt by the hand. Leaving both masters and superiors aside, you must stay with us. That will be found both natural and proper. Well, then, especially as I feel welcome here. Why should you not be welcome? There is nothing between us. Kurt tries vainly to hide a sense of displeasure. What could there be? You were a little careless as a young man, but I have forgotten all about it. I don't let things rankle. Alice looks annoyed. All three sit down at the sewing table. Well, you have strayed far and wide in the world. Yes, and now I have found a harbor with you. Whom you married off twenty-five years ago. It was not quite that way, but it doesn't matter. It is pleasing to see that you have stuck together for twenty-five years. Well, we have borne with it. Now and then it has been so-so, but, as you say, we have stuck together. And Alice has had nothing to complain of. There has been plenty of everything, heaps of money. Perhaps you don't know that I am a celebrated author, an author of textbooks. Yes, I recall that when we parted you had just published a volume on rifle practice that was selling well. Is it still used in the military schools? It is still in evidence, and it holds its place as number one, though they have tried to substitute a worse one, which is being used now, but which is totally worthless. You have been travelling abroad, I have heard. We have been down to Copenhagen five times. Think of it. Well, you see, when I took Alice away from the stage— Oh, you took me? Yes, I took you as a wife should be taken. How brave you have grown. But as it was held up against me afterward that I had spoiled her brilliant career— Hmm. I had to make up for it by promising to take my wife to Copenhagen, and this I have kept fully. Five times we have been there. Five. Holding up the five fingers of the left hand. Have you been in Copenhagen? No, I have been mostly in America. America? Isn't that a rotten sort of a country? It is not Copenhagen. Have you... Heard anything from your children? No. I hope you pardon me, but was it not rather inconsiderate to leave them like that? I didn't leave them, but the court gave them to the mother. Don't let's talk of that now. I, for my part, think it was lucky for you to get out of that mess. How are your children? Well, thank you. They are at school in the city and will soon be grown up. Yes, they're splendid kids, and the boy has a brilliant head. Brilliant! He is going to join the general staff. If they accept him. Him? Who has the making of a war minister in him? From one thing to another, there is to be a quarantine station here, against plague, cholera, and that sort of thing. And the doctor will be my superior, as you know. What sort of man is he? Man? He is no man. He's an ignorant rascal. That is very unpleasant for me. Oh, it is not quite as bad as Edgar makes it out. But I must admit that I have small sympathy for the man. 
A rascal, that's what he is, and that's what the others are, too. The collector of customs, the postmaster, the telephone girl, the druggist, the pilot. What is it they call him now? Uh, the pilot master. Rascals, one and all, and that's why I don't associate with them. Are you on bad terms with all of them? Every one. Yes, it is true that intercourse with those people is out of the question. It is as if all the tyrants of the country had been sent to this island for safekeeping. Exactly. Hmm. Is that meant for me? I am no tyrant. Not in my own house, at least. You know better. Oh, believe her. I am a very reasonable husband, and the old lady is the best wife in the world. Would you like something to drink, Kurt? No, thank you. Not now. Have you turned? A little moderate only. Is that American? Yes. No moderation for me, or I don't care at all. A man should stand his liquor. Returning to our neighbors on the island, my position will put me in touch with all of them, and it is not easy to steer clear of everything, for no matter how little you care to get mixed up in other people's intrigues, you are drawn into them just the same. You had better take up with them. In the end you will return to us, for here you find your true friends. Is it not dreadful to be alone among a lot of enemies, as you are? It is not pleasant. It isn't dreadful at all. I have never had anything but enemies all my life, and they have helped me on instead of doing me harm. And when my time to die comes, I may say that I owe nothing to anybody, and that I have never got a thing for nothing. Every particle of what I own I have had to fight for. Yes, Edgar's path has not been strewn with roses. No, with thorns and stones, pieces of flint. But a man's own strength. Do you know what that means? Yes. I learned to recognize its insufficiency about ten years ago. Then you are no good. Edgar? He is no good, I say, if he does not have the strength within himself. Of course it is true that when the mechanism goes to pieces there is nothing left but a barrow full to chuck out on the garden bed. But as long as the mechanism holds together, the thing to do is to kick and fight with hands and feet until there is nothing left. That is my philosophy. It is fun to listen to you. But you don't think it's true? No, I don't. But true it is for all that. During the preceding scene the wind has begun to blow hard, and now one of the big doors is closed with a bang. Captain Rising. It's blowing. I could just feel it coming. Goes back and closes both doors. Knocks on the barometer. You will stay for supper. Thank you. But it will be very simple, as our housemaid has just left us. Oh, it will do for me, I'm sure. You ask for so little, dear Kurt. Captain at the barometer. If you can only see how the mercury is dropping. Oh, I felt it coming. Alice secretly to Kurt. He is nervous. We ought to have supper soon. Alice rising. I am going to see about it now. You can sit here and philosophize. Secretly to Kurt. But don't contradict him, for then he gets into a bad humor. And don't ask him why he was not made a major. Kurt nods assent. Alice goes towards the right. See that we get something nice now, old lady. You give me money and you'll get what you want. Always money. Alice goes out. Money, money, money. All day long I have to stand ready with the purse, until at last I have come to feel as if I myself were nothing but a purse. Are you familiar with that kind of thing? Oh, yes, with the difference that I took myself for a pocket-book. Ha! Ha! So you know the flavor of the brand. Oh, the ladies! Ha! Ha! And you had one of the proper kind. Let that be buried now. She was a jewel. Then I have, after all, in spite of everything, one that's pretty decent. For she is straight, in spite of everything. In spite of everything. Don't you laugh? In spite of everything. Yes, 
she has been a faithful mate, a splendid mother, excellent, but, with a glance at the door on the right, she has a devilish temper. Do you know there have been moments when I cursed you for saddling me with her? But I didn't. Listen, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk nonsense and forget things that are not pleasant to remember. Don't take it badly, please. I am accustomed to command and raise cane, you see. But you know me, and don't get angry. Not at all. But I have not provided you with a wife. On the contrary. Captain, without letting his flow of words be checked. Don't you think life is queer, anyhow? I suppose so. And to grow old, it is no fun, but it is interesting. Well, my age is nothing to speak of, but it does begin to make itself felt. All your friends die off, and then you become so lonely. Lucky the man who can grow old in company with a wife. Lucky? Well, it is luck, for the children go their way, too. You ought not to have left yours. Well, I didn't. They were taken away from me. Don't get mad now, because I tell you. But it was not so. Well, well, whichever way it was, it has now become forgotten, and you are alone. You get accustomed to everything. Do you... Uh, is it possible to get accustomed to uh, being quite alone also? Here am I. What have you been doing these fifteen years? What a question, these fifteen years. They say you have got hold of money and grown rich. I can hardly be called rich. I am not going to ask for a loan. If you were, you would find me ready. Many thanks, but I have my bank account. You see, with a glance toward the door on the right, nothing must be lacking in this house and the day i had no more money she would leave me oh no no well i know better think of it she makes a point of asking me when i happen to be short just for the pleasure of showing me that i am not supporting my family but i heard you say that you have a large income of course i have a large income but it is not enough then it is not large as such things are reckoned Life is queer, and we as well. The telegraph receiver begins to click. What is that? Nothing but a time correction. Have you no telephone? Yes, in the kitchen. But we use the telegraph, because the girls at the Central report everything we say. Social conditions out here by the sea must be frightful. They are simply horrible. But all life is horrible. And you, who believe in a sequel, do you think there will be any peace further on? I presume there will be storms and battles there also. There also? If there be any there, I prefer annihilation. Are you sure that annihilation will come without pain? I am going to die all of a sudden, without pain. So you know that? Yes, I know it. You don't appear satisfied with your life. Satisfied? The day I could die, I should be satisfied. Kurt, rising. That you don't know. But tell me, what is going on in this house? What is happening here? There is a smell as of poisonous wallpaper, and one feels sick the moment one enters. I should prefer to get away from here had I not promised Alice to stay. There are dead bodies beneath the flooring, and the place is so filled with hatred that one can hardly breathe. The captain sinks together and sits staring into vacancy. What is the matter with you? Edgar? The captain does not move. Slaps the captain on the shoulder. Edgar? Captain, recovering consciousness. Did you say anything? Looks around. I thought it was, uh, Alice. Oh, is that you? Say... Captain relapses into apathy. This is horrible. Kurt goes over to the door on the right and opens it. Alice. Alice enters, wearing a kitchen apron. What is it? I don't know. Look at him. Oh, he goes off like that at times. I'll play and then he will wake up. No, don't. Not that way. Leave it to me. Does he hear or see? 
Just now he neither hears nor sees. And you can speak of that with such calm? Alice, what is going on in this house? Ask him there. Him there? But he is your husband. A stranger to me. As strange as he was twenty-five years ago. I know nothing at all about that man. Nothing but... Stop! He may overhear you. Now he cannot hear anything. A trumpet signal is sounded outside. Captain leaps to his feet and grabs saber and cap. Pardon me. I have to inspect the sentries. Captain goes out to the door in the background. Is he ill? I don't know. Has he lost his reason? I don't know. Does he drink? He boasts more of it than he really drinks. Sit down and talk, but calmly and truthfully. Alice sitting down. What am I to talk about? That I have spent a lifetime in this tower, locked up, guarded by a man whom I have always hated, and whom I now hate so beyond all bounds that the day he died I should be laughing until the air shook. Why have you not parted? You may well ask. While still engaged, we parted twice. Since then, we have been trying to part every single day. But we are chained together and cannot break away. Once we were separated, within the same house, for five whole years. Now nothing but death can part us. This we know, and for that reason we are waiting for him as for a liberator. Why are you so lonely? Because he isolates me. First he exterminated all my brothers and sisters from our home. He speaks of it himself as extermination. And then my girlfriends and everybody else. But his relatives? He has not exterminated them. Yes, for they came near taking my life after having taken my honor and good name. Finally, I became forced to keep up my connection with the world and with other human beings by means of that telegraph, for the telephone was watched by the operators. I have taught myself telegraphy, and he doesn't know it. You must not tell him, for then he would kill me. Frightful, frightful. But why does he hold me responsible for your marriage? Let me tell you now how it was. Edgar was my childhood friend. When he saw you, he fell in love at once. He came to me and asked me to plead his cause. I said no at once. And, my dear Alice, I knew your tyrannical and cruel temperament. For that reason I warned him, and when he persisted, I sent him to get your brother for his spokesman. I believe what you say. But he has been deceiving himself all these years, so that now you can never get him to believe anything else. Well, let him put the blame on me if that can relieve his sufferings. But that is too much. I am used to it. But what does hurt me is his unjust charge that I have deserted my children. That's the manner of man he is. He says what suits him and that he believes it. But he seems to be fond of you, principally because you don't contradict him. <sighs> Try not to grow tired of us now. I believe you have come in what was to us a fortunate moment. I think it was even providential. Kurt, you must not grow tired of us, for we are undoubtedly the most unhappy creatures in the whole world. <laughs> I have seen one marriage at close quarters, and it was dreadful. But this is almost worse. <laughs> Do you think so? Yes. Whose fault is it? The moment you quit asking whose fault it is, Alice, you will feel a relief. Try to regard it as a fact, a trial that has to be borne. I cannot do it. It is too much. Alice rising. It is beyond help. I pity both of you. Do you know why you are hating each other? No. It is the most unreasoning hatred without cause, without purpose, but also without end. And can you imagine why he is principally afraid of death? He fears that I may marry again. Then he loves you. <laughs> Probably. But that does not prevent him from hating me. It is called love-hatred, and it hails from the pit. Does he like you to play for him? Yes, but only horrid melodies. For instance, that awful, The Entry of the Boyars. When he hears it, he loses his head and wants to dance. Does he dance? Oh, <laughs> he is very funny at times. One thing, pardon me for asking, where are the children? 
Perhaps you don't know that two of them are dead. So you have had that to face also. What is there I have not faced? But the other two? In the city. They couldn't stay at home. For he set them against me. And you set them against him? Of course. And then parties were formed, votes bought, bribes given. And in order not to spoil the children completely, we had to part from them. What should have been the uniting link became the seed of dissension. What has held the blessing of the home turned into a curse. Well, I believe sometimes that we belong to a cursed race. Yes, is it not so, ever since the fall? Alice, with a venomous glance and sharp voice. What fall? That of our first parents. Oh, I thought you meant something else. Alice, with folded hands. Kurt, my kinsman. My childhood friend, I have not always acted toward you as I should. But now I am being punished, and you are having your revenge. No revenge. Nothing of that kind here. Hush. Do you recall one Sunday while you were engaged, and I had invited you for dinner? Never mind. I must speak. Have pity on me. When you came to dinner we had gone away and you had to leave again. You had received an invitation yourselves. What is that to speak of? Kurt, when, today, a little while ago, I asked you to stay for supper, I thought we had something left in the pantry. Hiding her face in her hands. And there is not a thing, not even a piece of bread. Alice, poor Alice. But when he comes home and wants something to eat and there is nothing, then he gets angry. You have never seen him angry. Oh, God, what humiliation! Will you not let me go out and arrange for something? There is nothing to be had on this island. Not for my sake, but for his and yours. Let me think up something. Something. We must make the whole thing seem laughable when he comes. I'll propose that we have a drink, and in the meantime I'll think of something. Put him in good humor. Play for him any old nonsense. Sit down at the piano and make yourself ready. Look at my hands. Are they fit to play with? I have to wipe glasses and polish brass, sweep floors and make fires. But you have two servants. So we have to pretend because he is an officer. But the servants are leaving us all the time, so that often we have none at all. Most of the time, in fact. How am I to get out of this? This about supper. Oh, if only fire would break out in this house. Don't, Alice, don't. If the sea would rise and take us away. No, no, no. I cannot listen to you. What will he say? What will he say? Don't go, Kurt. Don't go away from me. No, dear Alice, I shall not go. Yes, but when you are gone. Has he ever laid hands on you? On me? Oh, no, for he knew then that I should have left him. One has to preserve some pride. From without is heard. Who goes there? Friend. Kurt rising. Is he coming? Yes, that's he. What in the world are we to do? I don't know. I don't know. Captain enters from the background, cheerful. There. Leisure now. Well, has she had time to make her complaint? Is she not unhappy, huh? How's the weather outside? Half storm. Facetiously, opening one of the doors ajar. Sir Bluebeard with the maiden in the tower, and outside stands the sentry with drawn sabre to guard the pretty maiden. And then come the brothers, but the sentry is there. Look at him. Hip, hip. That's a fine sentry. Look at him. Marlborough son vaton guerre. Let us dance the sword dance. Kurt ought to see it. No, let us have the entry of the boyars instead. Oh, you know that one, do you? Alice in the kitchen apron. Come and play. Come, I tell you. Alice goes reluctantly to the piano. Captain pinching her arm. Now, have you been blackguarding me? I? Kurt turns away from them. Alice plays the entry of the boyers. The captain performs some kind of Hungarian dance step behind the writing table so that his spurs are set jingling. Then he sinks down on the floor without being noticed by Kurt and Alice, and the latter goes on playing the piece to the end. 
Alice without turning around. Shall we have it again? Silence. Turns around and becomes aware of the captain, who is lying unconscious on the floor in such a way that he is hidden from the public by the writing table. Lord Jesus. She stands still, with arms crossed over her breast, and gives vent to a sigh as of gratitude and relief. Kurt turns around, hurries over to the captain. What is it? What is it? Is he dead? I don't know. Come and help me. Alice remains still. I cannot touch him. Is he dead? No, he lives. Oh. Kurt helps the captain to his feet and places him in a chair. Uh, wh wh what was it? You fell down. Did anything happen? You fell on the floor. What is the matter with you? With me? Nothing at all. I don't know of anything. What are you staring at me for? You are ill. What nonsense is that? You go on playing, Alice. Oh, now it's back again. Captain puts both hands up to his head. Can't you see that you are ill? Don't shriek. It's only a fainting spell. We must call a doctor. I'll use your telephone. I don't want any doctor. You must. We have to call him for our own sake. Otherwise we shall be held responsible. I'll show him the door if he comes here. I'll shoot him. Oh, now it's there again. Takes hold of his head. Kurt goes toward the door on the right. Now I am going to telephone. Kurt goes out. Alice takes off her apron. Will you give me a glass of water? I suppose I have to. Give him a glass of water. How amiable. Are you ill? Please pardon me for not being well. Will you take care of yourself, then? You won't do it, I suppose. No, of that you may be sure. The hour is come for which you have been waiting so long. The hour you believed would never come. Don't be angry with me. Kurt enters from the right. Oh, it's too bad. What did he say? He rang off without a word. Alice to the captain. There is the result of your limitless arrogance. I think I am growing worse. Try to get a doctor from the city. Alice goes to the telegraph instrument. We shall have to use the telegraph, then. Captain rising halfway from the chair, startled. Do you know how to use it? Alice working the key. Yes, I do. So, well, go on then. But isn't she treacherous? To Kurt. Come over here and sit by me. Kurt sits down beside the captain. Take my hand. I sit here and fall. Can you make it out? Down something. Such a queer feeling. Have you had any attack like this before? Never. While you are waiting for an answer from the city, I'll go over to the doctor and have a talk with him. Has he attended you before? He has. Then he knows your case. Kurt goes toward the left. There will be an answer shortly. It is very kind of you, Kurt. But come back soon. As soon as I can. Kurt goes out. Kurt is kind. And how he has changed. Yes, and for the better. It is too bad, however, that he must be dragged into our misery just now. But good for us. I wonder just how he stands. Did you notice that he didn't speak of his own affairs? I did notice it. But then I don't think anybody asked him. Think what a life and ours. I wonder if it is the same for all people. Perhaps. Although they don't speak of it as we do. At times I have thought that misery draws misery, and that those who are happy shun the unhappy. That is the reason why we see nothing but misery. Have you known anybody who is happy? Let me see. No. Yes, the Eck marks. Oh, you don't mean it. She had to have an operation last year. That's right. Well, then I don't know. Yes, the von Krafts. Yes, the whole family lived an idyllic life. Well off, respected by everybody. Nice children, good marriages. Right along until they were fifty. Then that cousin of theirs committed a crime that led to a prison term, and all sorts of after-effects. And that was the end of their peace. 
The family name was dragged in the mud by all the newspapers. The Kraft murder case made it impossible for the family to appear anywhere, after having been so much thought of. The children had to be taken out of school. Oh, heavens! I wonder what my trouble is. What do you think? Heart or head, it, it is as if the soul wanted to fly off and turn into smoke. Have you any appetite? Yes. How about the supper? Alice crosses the stage, disturbed. I'll ask Jenny. Why, she's gone. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Ring for Christine so that I can get some fresh water. Alice rings. I wonder. Rings again. She doesn't hear. Go and look. Just think if she had left also. Alice goes over to the door on the left and opens it. What is this? Her trunk is in the hallway. Packed. Then she has gone. Oh, this is hell! Alice begins to cry, falls on her knees and puts her head on a chair, sobbing. And everything at once. And then Kurt had to turn up just in time to get a look into this mess of ours. If there be any further humiliation in store, let it come this moment. Do you know what I suspect? Kurt went away and will not come back. I believe it of him. Yes, we are cursed. What are you talking of? Don't you see how everybody shuns us? I don't mind. The telegraph receiver clicks. There is the answer. Hush, I can hear it. Nobody can spare the time. Evasions, the rabble. That's what you get because you have despised your physicians and failed to pay them. That is not so. Even when you could, you didn't care to pay their bills because you looked down upon their work, just as you have looked down upon mine and everybody else's. They don't want to come and the telephone is cut off, because you didn't think that good for anything either. Nothing is good for anything but your rifles and guns. Don't stand there and talk nonsense. Everything comes back. What sort of superstition is that? Talk for old women. You will see. Do you know that we owe Christine six months' wages? Well, she has stolen that much. But I have also had to borrow money from her. I think you capable of it. Oh, what an ingrate you are! You know I borrowed that money for the children to get into the city. Gert had a fine way of coming back. A rascal, that one too, and a coward. He didn't dare to say he had had enough, and that he found the doctor's party more pleasant. He's the same rapscallion as ever. Kurt enters quickly from the left. Well, my dear Edgar, this is how the matter stands. The doctor knows everything about your heart. My heart? You have long been suffering from calcification of the heart. Stone heart? And? Is it serious? Well, that is to say. It is serious. Yes. Fatal? You must be very careful. First of all, the cigar must go. The captain throws away his cigar. And next, no more whiskey. Then, to bed. No! I don't want that. Not to bed. That's the end. Then you never get up again. I shall sleep on the couch tonight. What more did he say? He was very nice about it, and will come at once if you call him. Was he nice, the hypocrite? I don't want to see him. I can at least eat. Not tonight, and during the next few days nothing but milk. Milk? I cannot take that stuff into my mouth. Better learn how. I am too old to learn. He puts his hand up to his head. Oh, there it is again now. He sits perfectly still, staring straight ahead. Alice to Kurt. What did the doctor tell you? That he may die. Oh, thank God. Take care, Alice, take care. And now go and get a pillow and a blanket, and I'll put him here on the couch. Then I'll sit on the chair here all night. And I? You go to bed. Your presence seems only to make him worse. Command. I shall obey, for you seem to mean well toward both of us. Alice goes out to the left. Mark you, toward both of you, and I shall not mix in any partisan squabbles. Kurt takes the water bottle and goes out to the right. 
The noise of the wind outside is clearly heard. Then one of the doors is blown open, and an old woman of shabby, unprepossessing appearance peeps into the room. Captain wakes up, rises, and looks around. So they have left me, the rascals. He catches sight of the old woman and is frightened by her. Who is it? What do you want? I just wanted to close the door, sir. Why should you? Because it blew open just as I passed by. Wanted to steal, did you? Not much here to take away, Christine said. Good night, sir, and sleep well. Old woman closes the door and disappears. Alice comes in from the left with pillows and a blanket. Who was that at the door? Anybody? Why, it was old Mary from the poorhouse who just went by. Are you sure? Are you afraid? I afraid? Oh, no. As you don't want to go to bed, you can lie here. Captain goes over to the couch and lies down. I'll lie here. Tries to take Alice's hand, but she pulls it away. Kurt comes in with the water bottle. Kurt, don't go away from me. I'm going to stay up with you all night. Alice is going to bed. Good night, then, Alice. Good night, Kurt. Good night. Alice goes out. Kurt takes a chair and sits down beside the couch. Don't you want to take off your boots? No. A warrior should always be armed. Are you expecting a battle, then? Perhaps. Rising up in bed. Kurt, you are the only human being to whom I have ever disclosed anything of myself. Listen to me. If I die tonight, look after my children. I will do so. Thank you. I trust in you. Can you explain why you trust me? We have not been friends, for friendship is something I don't believe in, and our families were born enemies and have always been at war. And yet you trust me? Yes, and I don't know why. Do you think I am going to die? You as well as everybody. There will be no exception made in your case. Are you bitter? Yes. Are you afraid of death, of the wheelbarrow and the garden bed? Think, if it were not the end. That's what a great many think. And then? Nothing but surprises, I suppose. But nothing at all is known with certainty. No, that's just it. That is why you must be prepared for everything. You are not childish enough to believe in hell. Do you not believe in it, you who are right in it? That is metaphorical only. The realism with which you have described yours seems to preclude all thought of metaphors, poetical or other. If you only knew what pangs I suffer. Of the body? No, not of the body. Then it must be of the spirit, for no other alternative exists. Captain rising up in bed. I don't want to die. Not long ago you wished for annihilation. Yes, if it be painless. Apparently it is not. Is this annihilation, then? The beginning of it. Good night. Good night. Curtain. End of Part 1, Scene 1. Part 1, Scene 2 of The Dance of Death. The same setting, but now the lamp is at the point of going out. Through the windows and the glass panes of the doors a gray morning is visible. The sea is stirring. The sentry is on the battery as before. The captain is lying on the couch asleep. Kurt sits on a chair beside him, looking pale and wearied from his watch. Alice in from the left. Is he asleep? Yes, since the time when the sun should have risen. What kind of night did he have? He slept now and then, but he talked a good deal. Of what? He argued about religion like a schoolboy, but with the pretension of having solved all the world riddles. Finally, toward morning, he invented the immortality of the soul. For his own glory. Exactly. He is actually the most conceited person I have ever met. I am, consequently, God must be. You have become aware of it. Look at those boots. With those he would have trampled the earth flat had he been allowed to do so. With those he has trampled down other people's fields and gardens. 
with those he has trampled on some people's toes and other people's heads. Man-eater, you have got your bullet at last. He would be comical were he not so tragical, and there are traces of greatness in all his narrow-mindedness. Have you not a single good word to say about him? Alice sitting down. Yes, if he only does not hear it. For if he hears a single word of praise, he develops megalomania on the spot. He can hear nothing now, for he has had a dose of morphine. Born in a poor home with many brothers and sisters, Edgar very early had to support the family by giving lessons, as the father was a ne'er-do-well, if nothing worse. It must be hard for a young man to give up all the pleasures of youth in order to slave for a bunch of thankless children whom he has not brought into the world. I was a little girl when I saw him, as a young man, going without an overcoat in the winter while the mercury stood at fifteen below zero. His little sisters wore kersey coats. It was fine, and I admired him, but his ugliness repelled me. Is he not unusually ugly? Yes, and his ugliness has a touch of the monstrous at times. Whenever we fell out I noticed it particularly, and when, at such times, he went away, his image assumed enormous forms and proportions, and he literally haunted me. Think of me then. However, his earlier years as an officer were undoubtedly a martyrdom. But now and then he was helped by rich people. This he will never admit, and whatever has come to him in that way he has accepted as a due tribute, without giving thanks for it. We were to speak well of him. Yes, after he is dead. But then I recall nothing more. Have you found him cruel? Yes. And yet he can show himself both kind and susceptible to sentiment. As an enemy he is simply horrible. Why did he not get the rank of major? Oh, you ought to understand that. They didn't want to raise a man above themselves who had already proved himself a tyrant as an inferior. But you must never let on that you know this. He says himself that he did not want promotion. Did he speak of the children? Yes, he was longing for Judith. I thought so. Oh, do you know what Judith is? His own image, whom he has trained for use against me. Think only that my own daughter has raised her hand against me. That is too much. Hush. He is moving. Think if he overheard us. He is full of trickery also. He is actually waking up. Does he not look like an ogre? Oh, I'm afraid of him. Captain Sturs wakes up, rises in bed, and looks around. It is morning, at last. How are you feeling? Not so very bad. Do you want a doctor? No. I want to see Judith, my child. Would it not be wise to set your house in order before, or if, something should happen? What do you mean? What could happen? What may happen to all of us? Oh, nonsense! Don't you believe that I die so easily? And don't rejoice prematurely, Alice. Think of your children. Make your will so that your wife at least may keep the household goods. Is she going to inherit from me while I am still alive? No, but if something happens, she ought not to be turned into the street. One who has dusted and polished and looked after these things for twenty-five years should have some right to remain in possession of them. May I send word to the regimental lawyer? No. You are a cruel man, more cruel than I thought you. Now it is back again. Falls back on the bed unconscious. Alice goes toward the right. There are some people in the kitchen. I have to go down there. Yes, go. Here is not much to be done. Captain recovers. Well, Kurt, what are you going to do about your quarantine? Oh, that will be all right. No, I am in command on this island, so you will have to deal with me. Don't forget that. Have you ever seen a quarantine station? Have I? Before you were born. 
and I'll give you a piece of advice. Don't place your disinfection plant too close to the shore. I was thinking that the nearer I could get to the water, the better. That shows how much you know of your business. Water, don't you see, is the element of the bacilli, their life element. But the salt water of the sea is needed to wash away all the impurity. Idiot! Well, now, when you get a house for yourself, I suppose you'll bring home your children. Do you think they will let themselves be brought? Of course, if you've got any backbone. It would make a good impression on the people if you fulfilled your duties in that respect also. I have always fulfilled my duties in that respect. In the one respect where you have proved yourself most remiss. Have I not told you? For one does not desert one's children like that. Go right on. As your relative, a relative older than yourself, I feel entitled to tell you the truth, even if it should prove bitter, and you should not take it badly. Are you hungry? Yes, I am. Do you want something light? No, something solid. Then you would be done for. Is it not enough to be sick? But one must starve also. That's how the land lies. And neither drink nor smoke. Then life is not worth much. Death demands sacrifices, or it comes at once. Alice enters with several bunches of flowers and some telegrams and letters. These are for you. Throws the flowers on the writing table. For me. Will you please let me look? Oh, they are only from the non-commissioned officers, the bandmen and the gunners. You are jealous. Oh, no. If it were laurel wreaths, that would be another matter. But those you can never get. Hmm. Here's a telegram from the Colonel. Read it, Kurt. The Colonel is a gentleman after all, though he is something of an idiot. And this is from... Oh, what does it say? Uh, it is from Judith. Please telegraph her to come with the next boat. And here? Yes, one is not quite without friends after all. And it is fine to see them take thought of a sick man, who was also a man of deserts above his rank, and a man free of fear or blemish. I don't quite understand. Are they congratulating you because you were sick? Aina. Yes, we had a doctor here on the island who was so hated that when he left they gave a banquet. After him, and not for him. Put the flowers in water. I am not easily caught, and all people are a lot of rabble. But, by heavens, these simple tributes are genuine. They cannot be anything but genuine. Fool. Kurt reading the telegram. Judith says she cannot come because the steamer is held back by the storm. Is that all? No, there is a postscript. Out with it! Well, she asks her father not to drink so much. Impudence! That's like children. That's my only beloved daughter, my Judith, my idol. And your image. Such is life. Such are its best joys. Hell. Now you get the harvest of your sowing. You have set her against her own mother, and now she turns against the father. <laughs> Tell me, then, that there is no God. What does the colonel say? He grants leave of absence without any comment. Leave of absence? I have not asked for it. No, but I have asked for it. I don't accept it. Order has already been issued. That's none of my concern. Do you see, Kurt, that for this man exist no laws, no constitutions, no prescribed human order? He stands above everything and everybody. The universe is created for his own private use. The sun and the moon pursue their courses in order to spread his glory among the stars. Such is this man, this insignificant captain who could not even reach the rank of major, and at whose strutting everybody laughs while he thinks himself feared. This poor wretch who is afraid in the dark and believes in barometers. 
and all this in conjunction with and having for its climax a barrow full of manure that is not even prime quality captain fanning himself with a bunch of flowers conceitedly without listening to alice have you asked kurt to breakfast no get us then at once two nice tenderloin steaks two i am going to have one myself but we are three here oh you want one also i'll make it three then where am i to get them last night you asked kurt to supper and there was not a crust of bread in the house kurt has been awake all night without anything to eat and he has had no coffee because there is none in the house and the credit is gone she is angry at me for not dying yesterday no for not dying twenty-five years ago for not dying before you were born listen to her that's what happens when you institute a marriage my dear kurt and it is perfectly clear that it was not instituted in heaven alice and kurt look at each other meaningly captain rises and goes toward the door however say what you will now i am going on duty he puts on an old-fashioned helmet with a brush crest girds on the saber and shoulders his cloak if anybody calls for me i am at the battery alice and kurt try vainly to hold him back captain goes out yes go you always go always show your back whenever the fight becomes too much for you and then you let your wife cover the retreat you hero of the bottle you arch braggart you arch liar fie on you this is bottomless and you don't know everything yet is there anything more but i'm ashamed where is he going now and where does he get the strength yes you may well ask now he goes down to the non-commissioned officers and thanks them for the flowers and then he eats and drinks with them and then he speaks ill of all the other officers if you only knew how many times he has been threatened with discharge nothing but sympathy for his family has saved him and this he takes for fear of his superiority that he hates and maligns the very women wives of other officers who have been pleading our cause i have to confess that i applied for this position in order to find peace by the sea and of your circumstances i knew nothing at all poor kurt and how will you get something to eat oh i can go over to the doctor's but you will you not permit me to arrange this for you if only he does not learn of it for then he would kill me kurt looking out through the window look he stands right in the wind out there on the rampart he is to be pitied for being what he is both of you are to be pitied but what can be done i don't know the mail brought a batch of unpaid bills also and those he did not see it may be fortunate to escape seeing things at times alice at the window he has unbuttoned his cloak and let the wind strike his chest now he wants to die that is not what he wants i think for a while ago when he felt his life slipping away he grabbed hold of mine and began to stir in my affairs as if he wanted to crawl into me and live my life oh that is just his vampire nature to interfere with other people's destinies to suck interest out of other existences to regulate and arrange the doings of others since he can find no interest whatever in his own life and remember kurt don't ever admit him into your family life don't ever make him acquainted with your friends for he will take them away from you and make them his own he is a perfect magician in this respect were he to meet your children you would soon find them intimate with him and he would be advising them and educating them to suit himself but principally in opposition to your wishes alice was it not he who took my children away from me at the time of the divorce since it is all over now yes it was he i have suspected it but never had any certainty it was he when you placed your full trust in my husband and sent him to make peace between yourself and your wife he made love to her instead and taught her the trick that gave her the children oh god 
God in heaven! There you have another side of him. Do you know, last night when he thought himself dying, then he made me promise that I should look after his children. But you don't want to revenge yourself on my children. Yes, by keeping my promise. I shall look after your children. You could take no worse revenge, for there is nothing he hates so much as generosity. Then I may consider myself revenged without any revenge. I love revenge as a form of justice, and I am yearning to see evil get its punishment. Do you still remain at that point? There I shall always remain. And the day I forgave or loved an enemy, I should be a hypocrite. It may be a duty not to say everything, Alice, not to see everything. It is called forbearance, and all of us need it. Not I. My life lies clear and open, and I have always played my cards straight. That is saying a good deal. No, it is not saying enough. Because what I have suffered innocently for the sake of this man whom I never loved... Why did you marry? Who can tell? Because he took me, seduced me. I don't know. And then I was longing to get up on the heights. And deserted your art? Which was despised. But you know he cheated me. He held out hopes of a pleasant life, a handsome home. There was nothing but debts. No gold except on the uniform. And even that was not real gold. He cheated me. Wait a moment. When a young man falls in love, he sees the future in a hopeful light. That his hopes are not always realized, one must pardon. I have the same kind of deceit on my own conscience, without thinking myself dishonest. What is it you see on the rampart? I want to see if he has fallen down. Has he? No. Worse luck. He is cheating me all the time. Then I shall call on the doctor and the lawyer. Alice sitting down at the window. Yes, dear Kurt, go. I shall sit here and wait. And I have learned how to wait. Curtain. Scene three. Same setting in full daylight. The sentry is pacing back and forth on the battery as before. Alice sits in the right-hand easy chair. Her hair is now gray. Kurt enters from the left after having knocked. Good day, Alice. Good day, Kurt. Sit down. Kurt sits down in the left-hand easy chair. The steamer is just coming in. Then I know what's in store, for he is on board. Yes, he is, for I caught the glitter of his helmet. What has he been doing in the city? Oh, I can figure it out. He dressed for parade, which means that he saw the colonel, and he put on white gloves, which means that he made some calls. Did you notice his quiet manner yesterday? Since he has quit drinking and become temperate, he is another man. Calm, reserved, considerate. I know it. And if that man had always kept sober, he would have been a menace to humanity. It is perhaps fortunate for the rest of mankind that he made himself ridiculous and harmless through his whiskey. The spirit in the bottle has chastised him. But have you noticed, since death put its mark on him, that he has developed a dignity which elevates? And is it not possible that with this new idea of immortality may have come a new outlook upon life? You are deceiving yourself. He is conjuring up something evil. And don't you believe what he says, for he lies with premeditation, and he knows the art of intriguing as no one else. Kurt watching Alice. Why, Alice, what does this mean? Your hair has turned gray in these two nights. <laughs> no, my friend. It has long been gray. And I have simply neglected to darken it since my husband is as good as dead. Twenty-five years in prison. Do you know that this place served as a prison in the old days? Prison? Well, the walls show it. And my complexion. Even the children took on prison color in here. I find it hard to imagine children prattling within these walls. There was not much prattling done either. And those two that died perished merely from lack of light. What do you think is coming next? The decisive blow at us two. 
I caught a familiar glimmer in his eye when you read out that telegram from Judith. It ought, of course, to have been directed against her. But she, you know, is inviolate. And so his hatred sought you. What are his intentions in regard to me, do you think? Hard to tell. But he possesses a marvellous skill in nosing out other people's secrets. And did you notice how all day yesterday he seemed to be living in your quarantine? How he drank a life interest out of your existence? How he ate your children alive? A cannibal, I tell you. For I know him. His own life is going. Or has gone. I also have that impression of his being already on the other side. His face seems to phosphoresce, as if he were in a state of decay, and his eyes flash like will-o'-the-wisps over graves or morasses. Here he comes. Tell him you thought it possible he might be jealous. No, he is too self-conceited. Show me the man of whom I need to be jealous. Those are his own words. So much the better, for even his faults carry with them a certain merit. Shall I get up and meet him anyhow? No. Be impolite, or he will think you false. And if he begins to lie, pretend to believe him. I know perfectly how to translate his lies, and get always at the truth with the help of my dictionary. I foresee something dreadful. But, Kurt, don't lose your self-control. My own advantage in our long struggle has been that I was always sober, and for that reason in full control of myself. He was always tripped by his whiskey. Now we shall see. Captain, in from the left in full uniform, with helmet, cloak, and white gloves, calm, dignified, but pale and hollow-eyed, moves forward with a tottering step and sinks down, his helmet and cloak still on, in a chair at the right of the stage, far from Curtin Alice. Good day. Pardon me for sitting down like this, but I feel a little tired. Good day. Welcome home. Welcome home. How are you feeling? Splendid. Only a little tired. What news from the city? Oh, a little of everything. I saw the doctor, among other things, and he said it was nothing at all, that I might live twenty years if I took care of myself. Alice to Kurt. Now he is lying. To the captain. Why, that's fine, my dear. So much for that. Silence, during which the captain is looking at Alice and Kurt as if expecting them to speak. Alice to Kurt. Don't say a word, but let him begin. Then he will show his cards. Did you say anything? No, not a word. Well, Kurt. Alice to Kurt. There, now he is coming out. Well, I went to the city, as you know. Kurt nods assent. Hmm, I picked up acquaintances, and among others, a young cadet. Pause, during which Kurt shows some agitation. As we are in need of cadets right here, I arranged with the colonel to let him come here. This ought to please you, especially when I inform you that he is your own son. To Kurt. The vampire. Don't you see? Under ordinary circumstances, that ought to please a father, but in my case it will merely be painful. I don't say why it should. You don't need to. It is enough that I don't want it. Oh, you think so? Well, then, you ought to know that the young man has been ordered to report here, and that from now on he has to obey me. Then I shall force him to seek transfer to another regiment. You cannot do it, as you have no rights over your son. No? No, for the court gave those rights to the mother. Then I shall communicate with the mother. You don't need to. Don't need to? No, for I have already done so. Yeah. Kurt rises but sinks back again. Alice to Kurt. Now he must die. Why, he is a cannibal. So much for that. Did you say anything? No. Have you grown hard of hearing? Yes, a little. But if you come nearer to me, I can tell you something between ourselves. That is not necessary, and a witness is sometimes good to have for both parties. You are right. 
witnesses are sometimes good to have. But, first of all, did you get that will? Alice hands him a document. The regimental lawyer drew it up himself. In your favor. Good. Reads the document and then tears it carefully into strips, which he throws on the floor. So much for that. Yeah. Did you ever see such a man? That is no man. Well, Alice, this was what I wanted to say. Go on, please. On account of your long-cherished desire to quit this miserable existence in an unhappy marriage, on account of the lack of feeling with which you have treated your husband and children, and on account of the carelessness you have shown in the handling of our domestic economy, I have, during this trip to the city, filed an application for divorce in the city court. Oh, and your grounds? Besides the grounds already mentioned, I have others of a purely personal nature. As it has been found that I may live another twenty years, I am contemplating a change from this unhappy marital union to one that suits me better, and I mean to join my fate to that of some woman capable of devotion to her husband, and who also may bring into the home not only youth, but, let us say, a little beauty. Alice takes the wedding ring from her finger and throws it at the captain. You are welcome. Captain picks up the ring and puts it in his vest pocket. She throws away the ring. The witness will please take notice. Alice rises in great agitation. And you intend to turn me out, in order to put another woman into my home? Yeah. Well, then, we'll speak plain language. Cousin Kurt, that man is guilty of an attempt to murder his wife. An attempt to murder? Yes, he pushed me into the water. Without witnesses. He lies again. Judith saw it. Well, what of it? She can testify to it. No, she cannot, for she says that she didn't see anything. Oh, you have taught the child to lie. I didn't need to, for you had taught her already. You have met Judith? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, God. The fortress has surrendered. The enemy will be permitted to depart in safety on ten minutes' notice. Places his watch on the table. Ten minutes. Watch on the table. Stops and puts one hand up to his heart. Alice goes over to the captain and takes his arm. What is it? I don't know. Do you want anything? A drink? Whiskey? No, I don't want to die. You... Straightening himself up. Don't touch me. Ten minutes, or the garrison will be massacred. Pulls the saber partly from the scabbard. Ten minutes. Captain goes out to the background. What kind of man is this? Oh, he is a demon, and no man. What does he want with my son? He wants him as a hostage, in order to be your master. He wants to isolate you from the authorities of the island. Do you know that the people around here have named this island Little Hell? I didn't know that. Alice, you are the first woman who ever inspired me with compassion. All others have seemed to me to deserve their fate. Don't desert me now. Don't leave me, for he will beat me. He has been doing so all these twenty-five years, in the presence of the children, and he has pushed me into the water. Having heard this, I place myself absolutely against him. I came here without an angry thought, without memory of his former slanders and attempts to humiliate me. I forgave him, even when you told me that he was the man who had parted me from my children, for he was ill and dying. But now, when he wants to steal my son, he must die, he or I. Good. No surrender of the fortress but blow it up instead with him in it, even if we have to keep him company. I am in charge of the powder. There was no malice in me when I came here, and I wanted to run away when I felt myself infected with your hatred, but now I am moved by an irresistible impulse to hate this man, as I hate everything that is evil. What can be done? I have learned the tactics from him. Drum up his enemies and seek allies. 
just think that he should get hold of my wife why didn't those two meet a lifetime ago then there would have been a battle royal that had set the earth quaking but now these souls have spied each other and yet they must part i guess what is his most vulnerable spot i have long suspected it who is his most faithful enemy on the island the quartermaster is he an honest man he is and he knows what i i know too he knows what the sergeant major and the captain have been up to what have they been up to you don't mean defalcations this is terrible no i don't want to have any finger in that mess <laughs> you cannot hit an enemy formerly i could but i can do so no longer why because i have discovered that justice is done anyhow and you could wait for that then your son would already have been taken away from you look at my gray hair just feel how thick it still is for that matter he intends to marry again and then i shall be free to do the same i am free and in ten minutes he will be under arrest down below right under us stamps her foot on the floor right under us and i shall dance above his head i shall dance the entry of the boyars makes a few steps with her arms akimbo <laughs> and i shall play on the piano so that he can hear it hammering on the piano oh the tower is opening its gates and the sentry with the drawn saber will no longer be guarding me but him Malrof sans va ton guerre. Him, 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 the sentry is going to guard. Kurt has been watching her with an intoxicated look in his eyes. Alice, are you too a devil? Alice jumps up on a chair and pulls down the wreaths. These we will take along when we depart. The laurels of triumph and fluttering ribbons. A little dusty, but eternally green. Like my youth. I am not old, Kurt. You are a devil. In little hell. Listen, now I shall fix my hair. Alice loosens her hair. Dress in two minutes. Go to the quartermaster in two minutes. And then up in the air with the fortress. You are a devil. That's what you always used to say when we were children. Do you remember when we were small and became engaged to each other? <laughs> you were bashful, of course. Alice. Yes, you were. And it was becoming to you. Do you know there are gross women who like modest men? And there are said to be modest men who like gross women. You liked me a little bit didn't you i don't know where i am with an actress whose manners are free but who is an excellent lady otherwise yes but now i am free 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 turn away and i'll change my waist she opens her waist kurt rushes up to her grabs her in his arms lifts her high up and bites her throat so that she cries out. Then he drops her on the couch and runs out to the left. Curtain and Intermission Scene 4 Same stage setting in early evening light. The sentry on the battery is still visible through the windows in the background. The laurel wreaths are hung over the arms of an easy chair. The hanging lamp is lit. Faint music. The captain, pale and hollow-eyed, his hair showing touches of gray, dressed in a worn undress uniform with riding boots sits at the writing table and plays solitaire. He wears his spectacles. The on-track music continues after the curtain has been raised and until another person enters. The captain plays away at his solitaire, but with a sudden start now and then, when he looks up and listens with evident alarm. He does not seem able to make the solitaire come out, so he becomes impatient and gathers up the cards. Then he goes to the left-hand window, opens it, and throws out the cards. The window, of the French type, remains open, rattling on its hinges. He goes over to the buffet, but is frightened by the noise made by the window, 
so that he turns around to see what it is. Takes out three dark-colored square whiskey bottles, examines them carefully, and throws them out of the window. Takes out some boxes of cigars, smells at one, and throws them out of the window. Next, he takes off his spectacles, cleans them carefully, and tries how far he can see with them. Then he throws them out of the window, stumbles against the furniture as if he could not see, and lights six candles on a candelabrum on the chiffonier, catches sight of the lower wreaths, picks them up and goes toward the window, but turns back, folds the wreaths carefully in the piano cover, fastens the corners together with pins taken from the writing table, and puts the bundle on a chair, goes to the piano, strikes the keyboard with his fists, locks the piano, and throws the key out through the window. Then he lights the candles on the piano, goes to the whatnot, takes his wife's picture from it, looks at this and tears it to pieces, dropping the pieces on the floor. The window rattles on its hinges, and again he becomes frightened. Then, after having calmed himself, he takes the pictures of his son and daughter, kisses them in an offhand way, and puts them into his pocket. All of the rest of the pictures he sweeps down with his elbow and pokes together into a heap with his foot. Then he sits down at the writing table, tired out, and puts a hand up to his heart, lights the candle on the table and sighs, stares in front of himself as if confronted with unpleasant visions, rises and goes over to the chiffonier, opens the lid, takes out a bundle of letters tied together with a blue silk ribbon, and throws the bundle into the fireplace of the glazed brick oven, closes the chiffonier. The telegraph receiver sounds a single click. The captain shrinks together in deadly fear and stands fixed to the spot, listening. But hearing nothing more from the instrument, he turns to listen in the direction of the door on the left, goes over and opens it, takes a step inside the doorway, and returns, carrying on his arm a cat whose back he strokes. Then he goes out to the right. Now the music ceases. Alice enters from the background, dressed in a walking suit with gloves and hat on. Her hair is black. She looks around with surprise at the many lighted candles. Kurt enters from the left, nervous. It looks like Christmas Eve here. Well? Alice holds out her hand for him to kiss. Thank me. Kurt kisses her hand unwillingly. Six witnesses, and four of them solid as rock. The report has been made, and the answer will come here by telegraph. Right here, into the heart of the fortress. So? You should say thanks, instead of so. Why has he lit so many candles? Because he is afraid of the dark, of course. Look at the telegraph key. Does it not look like the handle of a coffee mill? I grind, I grind, and the beans crack as when you pull teeth. What has he been doing in the room here? It looks as if he intended to move. Down below, that's where you are going to move. Don't, Alice. I think it's distressing. He was the friend of my youth, and he showed me kindness many times when I was in difficulty. He should be pitied. And how about me, who have done nothing wrong, and who have had to sacrifice my career to that monster? How about that career? Was it so very brilliant? What are you saying? Do you know who I am? What I have been? Now, now. Are you beginning already? Already? Alice throws her arms around Kurt's neck and kisses him. Kurt takes her by the arms and bites her neck so that she screams. Oh, you bite me. Yes, I want to bite your throat and suck your blood like a lynx. You have aroused the wild beast in me, that beast which I have tried for years to kill by privations and self-inflicted tortures. I came here believing myself a little better than you two, and now I am the vilest of all. Since I first saw you in all your odious nakedness, and since my vision became warped by passion, I have known the full strength of evil. What is ugly becomes beautiful, what is good becomes ugly and mean. Come here and I'll choke you with a kiss. He locks her in his arms. Alice holds up her left hand. Behold the mark of the shackles that you have broken. I was a slave, and you set me free. But I am going to bind you. You? I. For a moment I thought you were... Pious? Yes, you prated about the fall of man. Did I? And I thought you would come here to preach. You thought so. In an hour we shall be in the city, and then you shall see what I am. Then we will go to the theatre tonight, just to show ourselves. The shame will be his if I run away, don't you see? I begin to understand that prison is not enough. No, 
It is not. There must be shame also. A strange world. You commit a shameful act, and the shame falls on him. Well, if the world be so stupid. It is as if these prison walls had absorbed all the corruption of the criminals, and it gets into you if you merely breathe this air. You were thinking of the theatre and the supper, I suppose. I was thinking of my son. Alice strikes him on the mouth with her glove. Fogey. Kurt lifts his hand as if to strike her. Alice drawing back. To bow. Forgive me. Yes, on your knees. Kurt kneels down. Down on your face. Kurt touches the ground with his forehead. Kiss my foot. Kurt kisses her foot. And don't you ever do it again. Get up. Kurt rising. Where have I landed? Where am I? No, you know. Kurt looking around with horror. I believe almost. Captain enters from the right, looking wretched, leaning on a cane. Kurt, may I have a talk with you? Alone? Is it about that departure in safety? Captain sits down at the sewing table. Kurt, will you kindly sit down here by me a little while? And Alice, will you please grant me a moment of peace? What is up now? New signals. To Kurt. Please be seated. Kurt sits down reluctantly. And listen to the words of age and wisdom. And if a telegram should come, tip me off. Alice goes out to the left. Can you explain a fate like mine, like ours? No more than I can explain my own. What can be the meaning of this jumble? In my better moments I have believed that just this was the meaning, that we should not be able to catch a meaning, and yet submit. Submit? Without a fixed point outside myself I cannot submit. Quite right, but as a mathematician you should be able to seek that unknown point when several known ones are given. I have sought it, and I have not found it. Then you have made some mistake in your calculations. Do it all over again. I should do it over again? Tell me, where did you get your resignation? I have none left. Don't overestimate me. As you may have noticed, my understanding of the art of living has been elimination. That means wipe out and pass on. Very early in life I made myself a bag into which I chucked my humiliations, and when it was full I dropped it into the sea. I don't think any man ever suffered so many humiliations as I have, but when I wiped them out and passed on they ceased to exist. I have noticed that you have wrought both your life and your environment out of your poetical imagination. How could I have lived otherwise? How could I have endured? Puts his hand over his heart. How are you doing? Poorly. There comes a moment when the faculty for what you call poetical imagination gives out, and then reality leaps forth in all its nakedness. It is frightful. He is now speaking in a voice of lachrymose senility, and with his lower jaw drooping. Look here, my dear friend. Controls himself and speaks in his usual voice. Forgive me. When I was in the city and consulted the doctor, he said that I was played out and that I couldn't live much longer. Was that what he said? That's what he said. So it was not true. What? Oh, no, that was not true. Was the rest of it not true either? What do you mean? That my son was ordered to report here as cadet? I never heard of it. Do you know, your ability to wipe out your own misdeeds is miraculous. I don't understand what you are talking of. Then you have come to the end. Well, there is not much left. Tell me, perhaps you never applied for that divorce which would bring your wife into disgrace. Divorce? No, I have not heard of it. Kurt rising. Will you admit, then, that you have been lying? You employ such strong words, my friend. All of us need forbearance. Oh, you have come to see that. 
Yes, I have come to see that. And for this reason, Kurt, please forgive me. Forgive everything. That was a manly word, but I have nothing to forgive you, and I am not the man you believe me to be, no longer now, least of all one worthy of receiving your confessions. Life seemed so peculiar, so contrary, so malignant, ever since my childhood, and people seemed so bad that I grew bad also. Kurt on his feet, perturbed, and glancing at the telegraph instrument. Is it possible to close off an instrument like that? Hardly. Who is Sergeant Major Ustberg? An honest fellow, but something of a busybody, I should say. And who is the quartermaster? He is my enemy, of course, but I have nothing bad to say of him. Kurt looking out through the window, where a lantern is seen moving to and fro. What are they doing with the lantern out on the battery? Do you see a lantern? Yes, and people moving about. I suppose it is what we call a service squad. What is that? A few men and a corporal. Probably some wretch that has to be locked up. Oh. Now, when you know Alice, how do you like her? I cannot tell. I have no understanding of people at all. She is as inexplicable to me as you are, or as I am myself. For I am reaching the age when wisdom makes this acknowledgment. I know nothing. I understand nothing. But when I observe an action, I like to get at the motive behind it. Why did you push her into the water? I don't know. It merely seemed quite natural to me, as she was standing on the pier, that she ought to be in the water. Have you ever regretted it? Never. That's strange. Of course it is. So strange that I cannot realize that I am the man who has been guilty of such a mean act. Have you not expected her to take some revenge? Well, she seems to have taken it in full measure, and that, too, seems no less natural to me. What has so suddenly brought you to this cynical resignation? Since I looked death in the face, life has presented itself from a different viewpoint. Tell me. If you were to judge between Alice and myself, whom would you place in the right? Neither of you. But to both of you I should give endless compassion. Perhaps a little more of it to you. Give me your hand, Kurt. Kurt gives him one hand and puts the other one on the captain's shoulder. Old boy. Alice in from the left, carrying a sunshade. Well, how harmonious. Oh, friendship. Has there been no telegram yet? No. Oh, this delay makes me impatient. And when I grow impatient, I push matters along. Look, Kurt, how I give him the final bullet. And now he'll bite the grass. First, I load. I know all about rifle practice the famous rifle practice of which less than five thousand copies were sold. And then I aim. Fire. She takes aim with her sunshade. How is your new wife? The young, beautiful, unknown one? <laughs> you don't know. But I know how my lover is doing. Puts her arms around the neck of Kurt and kisses him. He thrusts her away from himself. He is well although still a little bashful. You wretch, whom I have never loved. You who were too conceited to be jealous. You never saw how I was leading you by the nose. The captain draws the saber and makes a leap at her, aiming at her several futile blows that only hit the furniture. Help! Help! Kurt does not move. Captain falls with the saber in his hand. Judith, avenge me! <gasps> Hooray! He's dead! Kurt withdraws toward the door in the background. Captain gets on his feet. Not yet. Sheathes the saber and sits down in the easy chair by the sewing table. Judith! Judith! Alice drawing near to Kurt. Now I go. With you. Kurt pushes her back with such force that she sinks to her knees. Go back to the hell whence you came. Goodbye forever. Goes to the door. Don't leave me, Kurt. She will kill me. Don't desert me, Kurt. Don't desert us. Goodbye. 
Kurt goes out. The wretch. That's a friend for you. Forgive me, Alice, and come here. Come quick. Alice over to the captain. That's the worst rascal and hypocrite I have met in my life. Do you know, you are a man after all. Listen, Alice, I cannot live much longer. Is that so? The doctor has said so. Then there was no truth in the rest, either. No. Oh, what have I done? There is help for everything. No, this is beyond helping. Nothing is beyond helping, if you only wipe it out and pass on. But the telegram. The telegram. Which telegram? Alice on her knees beside the captain. Are we then cast out? Must this happen? I have sprung a mine under myself, under us. Why did you have to tell untruths? And why should that man come here to tempt me? Oh, we are lost. Your magnanimity might have helped everything, forgiven everything. What is it that cannot be forgiven? What is it that I have not already forgiven you? Oh, you are right, but there is no help for this. I cannot guess it, although I know your ingenuity when it comes to villainies. Oh, if I could only get out of this, I should care for you. I should love you, Edgar. Listen to me. Where do I stand? Don't you think anybody can help us? Well, no man can. Who could then help? Looking the captain straight in the eye. I don't know. Think of it. What is to become of the children with their name dishonored? Have you dishonored that name? Not I. Not I. And then they must leave school. And as they go out into the world, they will be as lonely as we and as cruel as we. Then you didn't meet Judith, either. I understand now. No, but wipe it out. The telegraph receiver clicks. Alice flies up. Now ruin is overtaking us. To the captain. Don't listen. I am not going to listen, dear child. Just calm yourself. Alice, standing beside the instrument, raises herself on tiptoe in order to look out to the window. Don't listen. Don't listen. Captain holding his hands over his ears. Lisa, child, I am stopping up my ears. Alice on her knees, with lifted hands. God help us. The squad is coming. God in heaven! She appears to be moving her lips as if in silent prayer. The telegraph receiver continues to click for a while, and a long white strip of paper seems to crawl out of the instrument. Then complete silence prevails once more. Alice rises, tears off the paper strip, and reads it in silence. Then she turns her eyes upward for a moment, goes over to the captain and kisses him on the forehead. Oh, that is over now. It was nothing. Alice sits down in the other chair, puts her handkerchief to her face, and breaks into a violent spell of weeping. What kind of secrets are these? Don't ask. It is over now. As you please, child. You would not have spoken like that three days ago. What has done it? Well, dear, when I fell down that first time, I went a little way on the other side of the grave. What I saw has been forgotten, but the impression of it still remains. And it was? A hope for something better. Something better? Yes, that this could be the real life I have, in fact, never believed. It is death or something still worse. And we... Have probably been sent to torment each other. So it seems, at least. Have we tormented each other enough? Yes, I think so. And upset things. Looks around. Suppose we put things to rights and clean house. Yes. If it can be done. Captain gets up to survey the room. It can't be done in one day. No, it can't. In two, then. Many days. Let us hope so. Pause. Sits down again. So you didn't get free this time after all. But then you didn't get me locked up, either. Alice looks staggered. Yes, 
I know you wanted to put me in prison, but I wipe it out. I suppose you have done worse than that. Alice is speechless. And I was innocent of all those defalcations. And now you intend me to become your nurse? If you are willing. What else could I do? I don't know. Alice sits down, numbed and crushed. These are the eternal torments. Is there then no end to them? Yes, if we are patient. Perhaps life begins when death comes. No, oh, if it were so. You think Kurt a hypocrite? Of course I do. And I don't. For all who come near us turn evil and go their way. Kurt was weak, and the evil is strong. How commonplace life has become. Formerly blows were struck. Now you shake your fist at the most. I am fairly certain that three months from now we shall celebrate our silver wedding, with Kurt as best man, and with the doctor and Gerda among the guests. The quartermaster will make the speech, and the sergeant major will lead the cheering. And if I know the colonel right, he will come on his own invitation. Yes, you may laugh. But do you recall the silver wedding at Adolf in the Fusiliers? The bride had to carry her wedding ring on her right hand, because the groom, in a tender moment, had chopped off her left ring finger with his dirk. Alice puts her handkerchief to her mouth in order to repress her laughter. Are you crying? No, I believe you are laughing. Yes, child, partly we weep and partly we laugh. Which is the right thing to do? Don't ask me. The other day I read in a newspaper that a man had been divorced seven times, which means that he had been married seven times, and finally, at the age of ninety-eight, he ran away with his first wife and married her again. Such is love. If life be serious or merely a joke is more than I can decide. Often it is most painful when a joke, and its seriousness is, after all, more agreeable and peaceful. But when at last you try to be serious, somebody comes and plays a joke on you, as Kurt, for instance. Do you want a silver wedding? Alice remains silent. Oh, say yes. They will laugh at us, but what does it matter? We may laugh also, or keep serious, as the occasion may require. Well, all right. Silver wedding, then. Rising. Wipe out and pass on. Therefore, let us pass on. End of Part 1 Part 2, Scene 1 A rectangular drawing room in white and gold, the rear wall is broken by several French windows reaching down to the floor. These stand open, revealing a garden terrace outside. Along this terrace, serving as public promenade, runs a stone balustrade on which are arranged pots of blue and white faience with petunias and scarlet geraniums in them. Beyond, in the background, can be seen the shore battery with a sentry pacing back and forth. In the far distance, the open sea. At the left of the drawing room stands a sofa with gilded woodwork. In front of it are a table and chairs. At the right is a grand piano, a writing table, and an open fireplace. In the foreground, an American easy chair. By the writing table is a standing lamp of copper with a table attached to it. On the walls are several old-fashioned oil paintings. Alan is sitting at the writing table, engrossed in some mathematical problem. Judith enters from the background, in summer dress, short skirt, hair and a braid down her back, hat in one hand, and tennis racket in the other. She stops in the doorway. Alan rises, serious and respectful. Why don't you come and play tennis? I am very busy. Didn't you see that I had made my bicycle point toward the oak and not away from it? Yes, I saw it. Well, what does it mean? It means that you want me to come and play tennis, but my duty... I have some problems to work out, 
and your father is a rather exacting teacher do you like him yes i do he takes such interest in all his pupils he takes an interest in everything and everybody won't you come you know i should like to but i must not i'll ask papa to give you leave oh don't do that it'll only cause talk don't you think i can manage him he wants what i want i suppose that is because you're so hard you should be hard also i don't belong to the wolf family then you are a sheep rather that tell me why you don't want to come and play tennis you know it tell me anyhow the lieutenant yes you don't care for me at all but you cannot enjoy yourself with the lieutenant unless i am present so you can see me suffer am i as cruel as that i didn't know it well now you know it then i shall do better hereafter for i don't want to be cruel i don't want to be bad in your eyes you say this only to fasten your hold on me i'm already your slave but it does not satisfy you the slave must be tortured and thrown to the wild beasts you already have that other fellow in your clutches what do you want with me then let me go my own way and you can go yours do you send me away then i go as second cousins we shall have to meet now and then but i'm not going to bother you any longer Alan sits down at the table and returns to his problem. Judith, instead of going away, comes down the stage and approaches gradually the table where Alan is sitting. Don't be afraid. I'm going at once. I wanted only to see how the master of quarantine lives. Judith looks around. White and gold. A Bechstein grand. Well, well. We are still in the fort since Papa was pensioned. In the tower where Mamma has been kept twenty-five years and we are there on sufferance at that. You, you are rich. We are not rich. So you say, but you are always wearing fine clothes. But whatever you wear, for that matter, is becoming to you. Do you hear what I say? Judith drawing nearer. I do. How can you hear when you keep on figuring or whatever you are doing? I don't use my eyes to listen with. Your eyes? Have you ever looked at them in the mirror? Go away! You despise me, do you? Why, girl, I am not thinking of you at all. Judith still nearer. Archimedes is deep in his figures when the soldier comes and cuts him down. She stirs his paper about with the racket. Don't touch my papers! That's what Archimedes said also. Now you are thinking something foolish. You are thinking that I cannot live without you. Why can't you leave me alone? Be courteous and I'll help you with your examinations. You? Yes, I know the examiners. And what of it? Don't you know that one should stand well with the teachers? Do you mean your father and the lieutenant? And the colonel. And then you mean that your protection would enable me to shirk my work? You are a bad translator. Of a bad original. Be ashamed. So I am, both on your behalf and my own. I'm ashamed of having listened to you. Why don't you go? Because I know you appreciate my company. Yes, you manage always to pass by my window. You have always some errand that brings you into the city with the same boat that I take. You cannot go for a sail without having me to look after the jib. But a young girl shouldn't say that kind of thing. Do you mean to say that I am a child? Sometimes you're a good child and sometimes a bad woman. Me you seem to have picked to be your sheep. You are a sheep, and that's why I am going to protect you. Alan rising. The wolf makes a poor shepherd. You want to eat me! That's the secret of it, I suppose. You want to put your beautiful eyes in pawn to get possession of my head. Oh, you have been looking at my eyes. I didn't expect that much courage of you. Alan collects his papers and starts to go out toward the right. Judith places herself in front of the door. Get out of my way, or... Or? If you are a boy, bah, but you are a girl. And then? If you had any pride at all, you would be gone, as you may regard yourself as shown the door. I'll get back at you for that. I don't doubt it. I shall get back at you for that. Judith goes out. Kurt enters from the left. Where are you going, Alan? Oh, is that you? Who was it that left in such hurry so that the bushes shook? It was Judith. She is a little impetuous, but a fine girl. When a girl is cruel and rude, she's always said to be a fine girl. Don't be so severe, Alan. Are you not satisfied with your new relatives? I like Uncle Edgar. Yes, he has many good sides. How about your other teachers, the lieutenant, for instance? 
He's so uncertain. Sometimes he seems to have a grudge against me. Oh, no. You just go here and make people seem this or that. Don't brood, but look after your own affairs. Do what is proper and leave others to their own concerns. So I do, but they won't leave me alone. They pull you in, as the cuttlefish down at the landing. They don't bite, but they stir up vortices that suck. You have some tendency to melancholia, I think. Don't you feel at home here with me? Is there anything you miss? I've never been better off, but there's something here that smothers me. Here by the sea? Are you not fond of the sea? Yes, the open sea, but along the shores you find eelgrass, cuttlefish, jellyfish, sea nettles, or whatever they're called. You shouldn't stay indoors so much. Go out and play tennis. Oh, that's no fun. You are angry with Judith, I guess? Judith? You are so exacting toward people. It is not wise, for then you become isolated. I'm not exacting, but it feels as if I were lying at the bottom of a pile of wood and had to wait my turn to get into the fire. And it weighs on me. All that is above weighs me down. Bide your turn. The pile grows smaller. Yes, but so slowly, so slowly, and in the meantime I lie here and grow moldy. It is not pleasant to be young, and yet you young ones are envied. Are we? Would you change? No, thanks. Do you know what's worse than anything else? It's to sit still and keep silent while the old ones talk nonsense. I know that I'm better informed than they on some matters, and yet I must keep silent. Well, uh, pardon me, I'm not counting you among the old. Why not? Well, perhaps because we've only just now become acquainted. And because your ideas of me have undergone a change? Yes. During the years we were separated, I suppose you didn't always think of me in a friendly way. No. Did you ever see a picture of me? Uh, one. And it was very unfavorable. And old-looking? <laughs> yes. Ten years ago my hair turned gray in a single night. It has since then resumed its natural color without my doing anything for it. Let us talk of something else. There comes your aunt, my cousin. How do you like her? I don't want to tell. Then I shall not ask you. Alice enters dressed in a very light-colored walking suit and carrying a sunshade. Good morning, Kurt. Gives him a glance, signifying that Alan should leave. Kurt to Alan. Leave us, please. Alan goes out to the right. Alice takes a seat on the sofa to the left. Kurt sits down on a chair near her. He will be here in a moment, so you need not feel embarrassed. And why should I? You, with your strictness. Toward myself, yes. Of course. Once I forgot myself when, in you, I saw the liberator. But you kept your self-control. And for that reason we have a right to forget what has never been. Forget it, then. However, I don't think he has forgotten. You are thinking of that night when his heart gave out and he fell on the floor, and when you rejoiced too quickly, thinking him already dead? Yes. Since then he has recovered. But when he gave up drinking he learned to keep silent. And now he is terrible. He is up to something that I cannot make out. Your husband, Alice, is a harmless fool who has shown me all sorts of kindnesses. Beware of his kindnesses. I know them. Well, well. He has then blinded you also. Can you not see the danger? Don't you notice the snares? No. Then your ruin is certain. Oh, mercy. Think only I have to sit here and see disaster stalking you like a cat. I point at it, but you cannot see it. Alan, with his unspoiled vision, cannot see it either. He sees nothing but Judith, for that matter, and this seems to me a safeguard of our good relationship. Do you know Judith? A flirtatious little thing with a braid down her back and rather too short skirts. Exactly. But the other day I saw her dressed up in long skirts, and then she was a young lady. And not so very young either when her hair was put up. She is somewhat precocious, I admit. And she is playing with Alan. That's all right, so long as it remains play. So that is all right? Now Edgar will be here soon, and he will take the easy chair. 
He loves it with such passion that he could steal it. Why, he can have it. Let him sit over there, and we'll stay here. And when he talks, he's always talkative in the morning, when he talks of insignificant things, I'll translate them for you. Oh, my dear Alice, you are too deep, far too deep. What could I have to fear as long as I look after my quarantine properly and otherwise behave decently? You believe in justice and honor and all that sort of thing. Yes, and it is what experience has taught me. Once I believed the very opposite and paid dearly for it. Now he's coming. I have never seen you so frightened before. My bravery was nothing but ignorance of the danger. Danger? Soon you'll have me frightened, too. Oh, if I only could. There. The captain enters from the background in civilian dress. Black Prince Albert buttoned all the way. Military cap and a cane with a silver handle. He greets them with a nod and goes straight to the easy chair, where he sits down. Alice to Kurt. Let him speak first. This is a splendid chair you have here, dear Kurt. Perfectly splendid. I'll give it to you if you will accept it. That is not what I meant. But I mean it seriously. How much have I not received from you? Oh, nonsense. And when I sit here, I can overlook the whole island, all the walks. I can see all the people on their verandas, all the ships on the sea that are coming in and going out. You have really happened on the best piece of this island, which is certainly not an island of the blessed. Or what do you say, Alice? Yes, they call it Little Hell, and here Kurt has built himself a paradise, but without an eve, of course, for when she appeared, then the paradise came to an end. I say, do you know that this was a royal hunting lodge? So I have heard. You live royally, you. But, if I may say so myself, you have me to thank for it. Alice to Kurt. There, now he wants to steal you. I have to thank you for a good deal. Fudge! Tell me, did you get the wine cases? Yes. And are you satisfied? Quite satisfied, and you may tell your dealer so. His goods are always prime quality. Alice to Kurt at second-rate prices, and you have to pay the difference. What did you say, Alice? I? Nothing. Well, when this quarantine station was about to be established, I had in mind applying for the position, and so I made a study of quarantine methods. Alice to Kurt. Now he's lying. And I did not share the antiquated ideas concerning disinfection which were then accepted by the government for I placed myself on the side of the Neptunists, so called because they emphasize the use of water. Beg your pardon, but I remember distinctly that it was I who preached water, and you fire at that time. Not I? Nonsense. Yes, I remember that, too. You? I remember it so much the better because— Well, it's possible, but it does not matter. However— we have now reached a point where a new state of affairs— To Kurt, who wants to interrupt. Just a moment. Has begun to prevail. And when the methods of quarantining are about to become revolutionized— By the by, do you know who is writing those stupid articles in that periodical? No, I don't know. But why do you call them stupid? Alice to Kurt. Look out. It is he who writes them. He? To the captain. Not very well advised, at least. Well, are you the man to judge of that? Are we going to have a quarrel? Not at all. It is hard to keep peace on this island, but we ought to set a good example. Yes. Can you explain this to me? When I came here, I made friends with all the officials and became especially intimate with the regimental auditor, as intimate as men are likely to become at our age. And then, in a little while, it was shortly after your recovery, one after another began to grow cold toward me, and yesterday the auditor avoided me on the promenade. I cannot tell you how it hurt me. Have you noticed any ill feeling toward yourself? No, on the contrary. Alice to Kurt. Don't you understand that he has been stealing your friends? Kurt to the captain. I wondered whether it might have anything to do with this new stock issue to which I refused to subscribe. 
"'No, no. But can you tell me why you didn't subscribe?' "'Because I have already put my small savings into your soda factory, and also because a new issue means that the old stock is shaky.' "'That's a splendid lamp you have. Where did you get it?' "'In the city, of course.' "'Look out for your lamp.' "'You must not think that I am ungrateful or distrustful, Edgar.' "'No, but it shows small confidence to withdraw from an undertaking which you have helped to start.' "'Why, ordinary prudence bids everybody save himself and what is his.' "'Save? Is there any danger, then? Do you think anybody wants to rob you?' "'Why such sharp words?' "'Were you not satisfied when I helped you to place your money at six per cent?' "'Yes, and even grateful.' "'You are not grateful. It is not in your nature. But this you cannot help.' "'Listen to him.' "'My nature has shortcomings enough, and my struggle against them has not been very successful. But I do recognize obligations.' "'Show it, then.' Captain reaches out his hand to pick up a newspaper. Why, what is this? A death notice? The health commissioner is dead. Alice to Kurt. Now he is speculating in the corpse. This is going to bring about certain changes. In what respect? Captain Rising. That remains to be seen. Alice to the captain. Where are you going? I think I'll have to go to the city. Catches sight of a letter on the writing table. Picks it up as if unconsciously. Reads the address and puts it back. Oh, I hope you will pardon my absent-mindedness. No harm done. Why, that's Alan's drawing case. Where is the boy? He is out playing with the girls. That big boy? I don't like it. And Judith must not be running about like that. You had better keep an eye on your young gentleman, and I'll look after my young lady. Goes over to the piano and strikes a few notes. Splendid tone in this instrument. A Steinbeck, isn't it? A Beckstein. Yes, you are well fixed. Thank me for bringing you here. Alice to Kurt. He lies, for he tried to keep you away. Well, goodbye for a while. I am going to take the next boat. Captain scrutinizes the paintings on the walls as he goes out. Well? Well? I can't see through his plans yet. But tell me one thing. This envelope he looked at, from whom is the letter? I am sorry to admit it was my one secret. And he ferreted it out. Can you see that he knows witchery as I have told you before? Is there anything printed on the envelope? Yes, the Citizens' Union. Then he has guessed your secret. You want to get into the Riksdag, I suppose. And now you'll see that he goes there instead of you. Has he ever thought of it? No, but he is thinking of it now. I read it on his face while he was looking at the envelope. That's why he has to go to the city? No, he made up his mind to go when he read the death notice. What has he got to gain by the death of the health commissioner? Hard to tell. Perhaps the man was an enemy who had stood in the way of his plans. If he be as terrible as you say, then there is reason to fear him. Didn't you hear how he wanted to steal you? to tie your hands by means of pretended obligations that do not exist. For instance, he has done nothing to get you this position, but has, on the contrary, tried to keep you out of it. He is a man-thief, an insect, one of those wood-borers that eat up your insides, so that one day you find yourself as hollow as a dying pine-tree. He hates you, although he is bound to you by the memory of your youthful friendship. How keen-witted we are made by our hatreds and stupid by our loves, blind and stupid. Oh, no, don't say that. Do you know what is meant by a vampire? They say it is the soul of a dead person seeking a body in which it may live as a parasite. Edgar is dead, ever since he fell down on the floor that time. You see, he has no interests of his own, no personality, no initiative. But if he can only get hold of some other person, he hangs on to him, sends down roots into him, and begins to flourish and blossom. Now he has fastened himself on you. If he comes too close, I'll shake him off. Try to shake off a burr. Listen, do you know why he does not want Judith and Alan to play? 
I suppose he is concerned about their feelings. Not at all. He wants to marry Judith to the Colonel. That old widower? Yes. Horrible. And Judith? If she could get the General, who is eighty, she would take him in order to bully the Colonel, who is sixty. To bully, you know, that's the aim of her life. To trample down and bully. There you have the motto of that family. Can this be Judith, that maiden fair and proud and splendid? Oh, I know all about that. May I sit here and write a letter? Kurt puts the writing table in order. With pleasure. Alice takes off her gloves and sits down at the writing table. Now we'll try our hand at the art of war. I failed once when I tried to slay my dragon. But now I have mastered the trade. Do you know that it is necessary to load before you fire? Yes, and with ball cartridges at that. Kurt withdraws to the right. Alice ponders and writes. Alan comes rushing in without noticing Alice and throws himself face downward on the sofa. He is weeping convulsively into a lace handkerchief. Alice watches him for a while. Then she rises and goes over to the sofa, speaks in a tender voice. Alan? Alan sits up disconcertedly and hides the handkerchief behind his back. You should not be afraid of me, Alan. I am not dangerous to you. What is wrong? Are you sick? Yes. In what way? I, I don't know. Have you a headache? No. And your chest? Pain? Yes. Pain. Pain, as if your heart wanted to melt away. And it pulls. Pulls. How do you know? And then you wish to die. That you were already dead. And everything seems so hard. And you can only think of one thing. Always the same. But if two are thinking of the same thing, then sorrow falls heavily on one of them. Alan forgets himself and picks at the handkerchief. That's the sickness which no one can cure. You cannot eat and you cannot drink. You want only to weep. And you weep so bitterly. Especially out in the woods where nobody can see you. For at that kind of sorrow all men laugh. Men who are so cruel. Dear me, what do you want of her? Nothing. You don't want to kiss her mouth, for you feel that you would die if you did. When your thoughts run to her, you feel as if death were approaching. And it is death, child. That sort of death which brings life. But you don't understand it yet. I smell violets. It is herself. She steps closer to Alan and takes the handkerchief gently away from him. It is she. It is she everywhere. None but she. Oh. Oh. Alan cannot help burying his face in Alice's bosom. Poor boy. Poor boy. Oh, how it hurts. How it hurts. She wipes off his tears with the handkerchief. There, there. Cry. Cry to your heart's content. There now. Then the heart grows lighter. But now, Alan, rise up and be a man, or she will not look at you. She, the cruel one, who is not cruel. Has she tormented you? With the lieutenant? You must make friends with the lieutenant so that you can talk of her. That gives a little ease also. I don't want to see the lieutenant. Now look here, little boy. It won't be long before the lieutenant seeks you out in order to get a chance to talk of her. For... Alan looks up with a ray of hope on his face. Well, shall I be nice and tell you? Alan droops his head. He is just as unhappy as you are. No. Yes, indeed. And he needs somebody to whom he may unburden his heart when Judith has wounded him. You seem to rejoice in advance. Does she not want the lieutenant? She does not want you either, dear boy. For she wants the colonel. Alan is saddened again. Is it raining again? Well, the handkerchief you cannot have, for Judith is careful about her belongings and wants her dozen complete. Alan looks dashed. 
Yes, my boy, such is Judith. Sit over there now while I write another letter, and then you may do an errand for me. Alice sits down at the writing table and begins to write again. Lieutenant enters from the background, with a melancholy face, but without being ridiculous. Without noticing Alice, she makes straight for Alan. I say, Cadet. Alan rises and stands at attention. Please be seated. Alice watches them. The lieutenant goes up to Alan and sits down beside him, sighs, takes out a lace handkerchief just like the other one, and wipes his forehead with it. Alan stares greedily at the handkerchief. The lieutenant looks sadly at Alan. Alice coughs. <coughs> the lieutenant jumps up and stands at attention. Please, be seated. I beg your pardon, madame. Never mind. Please sit down and keep the cadet company. He is feeling a little lonely here on the island. Lieutenant conversing with Alan in low tone and uneasily. It is awfully hot. Rather. Have you finished the sixth book yet? I have just got to the last proposition. That's a tough one. Have you... Have, have you played tennis today? No, the sun was too hot. Yes. It is awfully hot today. Yes, it is very hot. Have you been out sailing today? No, I couldn't get anybody to tend the jib. Could you trust me sufficiently to let me tend the jib? That would be too great an honor for me, Lieutenant. Not at all, not at all. Do you think the wind might be good enough today, about dinner time, say? For that's the only time I'm free. It always calms down about dinner time, and that's the time Miss Judith has her lesson. Oh, yes, yes. Hmm. Do you think... Would one of you young gentlemen care to deliver a letter for me? Alan and the lieutenant exchange glances of mutual distrust. To Miss Judith? Alan and the lieutenant jump up and hasten over to Alice, but not without a certain dignity meant to disguise their emotion. Both of you? Well, the more safely my errand will be attended to. Alice hands the letter to the lieutenant. If you please, Lieutenant, I should like to have that handkerchief. My daughter is very careful about her things. There is a touch of pettishness in her nature. Give me that handkerchief. I don't wish to laugh at you, but you must not make yourself ridiculous needlessly. And the Colonel does not like to play the part of an Othello. She takes the handkerchief. Away with you now, young man, and try to hide your feelings as much as you can. The Lieutenant bows and goes out, followed closely by Alan. Alan? Alan stops unwillingly in the doorway. Yes, Aunt? Stay here, unless you want to inflict more suffering on yourself than you can bear. But he's going. Let him burn himself. But take care of yourself. I don't want to take care of myself. And then you cry afterward, and so I get the trouble of consoling you. I want to go. Go, then. But come back here, young madcap, and I'll have the right to laugh at you. Alan runs after the lieutenant. Alice writes again. Kurt enters. Alice, I have received an anonymous letter that is bothering me. Have you noticed that Edgar has become another person since he put off the uniform? I could never have believed that a coat might make such a difference. You didn't answer my question. It was no question. It was a piece of information. What do you fear? Everything. He went to the city. And his trips to the city are always followed by something dreadful. But I can do nothing because I don't know from which quarter the attack will begin. Alice folding the letter. We'll see whether I have guessed it. Will you help me then? Yes. But no further than my own interests permit. My own. That is, my children's. I understand that. Do you hear how silent everything is, here on land, out on the sea, everywhere? But behind the silence I hear voices, mutterings, cries. Hush, I hear something too. No, it was only the gulls. But I hear something else. And now I am going to the post office with this letter. Curtain End of Part 2, Scene 1 Part 2, Scene 2 Same stage setting. Alan is sitting at the writing table studying. Judith is standing in the doorway. 
She wears a tennis hat and carries the handlebars of a bicycle in one hand. Can I borrow your wrench? Alan, without looking up. No, you cannot. You are discourteous now, because you think I am running after you. I'm nothing at all. But I ask merely to be left alone. Judith comes nearer. Alan? Yes, what is it? You mustn't be angry with me. I'm not. Will you give me your hand on that? I don't want to shake hands with you, but I'm not angry. What do you want with me, anyhow? Oh, but you're stupid. Well, let it go at that. You think me cruel and nothing else. No, for I know that you are kind, too. You can be kind. Well, how can I help that you and the lieutenant run around and weep in the woods? Tell me, why do you weep? Alan is embarrassed. Tell me now. I never weep. And why have you become such good friends? Of what do you talk while you are walking about arm in arm? Alan cannot answer. Alan, you'll soon see what kind I am and whether I can strike a blow for one I like. And I want to give you a piece of advice, although I have no use for tail-bearing. Be prepared. For what? Trouble. From what quarter? From the quarter where you least expect it. Well, I'm rather used to disappointment. And life has not brought me much that was pleasant. What's in store now? You poor boy, give me your hand. Look at me. Don't you dare to look at me. Alan rushes out to the left in order to hide his emotion. Lieutenant in from the background. I beg your pardon. I thought that. Tell me, Lieutenant, will you be my friend and ally? If you'll do me the honor. Yes, a word only. Don't desert Alan when disaster overtakes him. What disaster? You'll soon see. This very day, perhaps. Do you like Alan? The young man is my best pupil, and I value him personally also on account of his strength of character. Yes, life has moments when strength is required. To bear up, to endure, to suffer, in a word. That was more than one word, I should say. However, you like Alan. Yes. Look him up, then, and keep him company. It was for that purpose I came here, for that and no other. I had no other object in my visit. I had not supposed anything of that kind. Of the kind you mean. Alan went that way. Judith pointing to the left. Lieutenant goes reluctantly to the left. Yes, I'll do what you ask. Do, please. Alice in from the background. What are you doing here? I wanted to borrow a wrench. Will you listen to me a moment? Of course I will. Alice sits down on the sofa. Judith remains standing. But tell me quickly what you want to say. I don't like long lectures. Lectures? Well then, put up your hair and put on a long dress. Why? Because you are no longer a child. And you are young enough to need no coquetry about your age. What does that mean? That you have reached marriageable age, and your way of dressing is causing scandal. Then I shall do what you say. You have understood, then? Oh, yes. And we are agreed? Perfectly. On all points? Even the tenderest. Will you at the same time cease playing with Alan? It is going to be serious, then. Yes. Then we may just as well begin at once. She has already laid aside the handlebars. Now she lets down the bicycle skirt and twists her braid into a knot which she fastens on top of her head with a hairpin taken out of her mother's hair. It is not proper to make your toilet in a strange place. Am I all right this way? Then I am ready. Come now, who dares? Now at last you look decent. And leave Alan in peace after this. I don't understand what you mean. Can't you see that he is suffering? Yes, I think I have noticed it, but I don't know why. I don't suffer. That is your strength. But the day will come. Oh, yes, you shall know what it means. Go home now and don't forget that you are wearing a long skirt. Must you walk differently, then? Just try. Judith tries to walk like a lady. Oh, my feet are tied. I'm caught. I cannot run any longer. Yes, child, the walking begins now along the slow road toward the unknown, which you know already but must pretend to ignore. Shorter steps, and much slower, much slower. The low shoes of childhood must go, Judith, and you have to wear boots. 
"'You don't remember when you laid aside baby socks and put on shoes. "'But I do. "'I can never stand this. "'And yet you must. "'Must.' "'Judith goes over to her mother and kisses her lightly on the cheek, "'then walks out with the dignified bearing of a lady, "'but forgetting the handlebars. "'Goodbye, then.' "'Kurt enters from the right. "'So you're already here?' Yes. Has he come back? Yes. How did he appear? In full dress. So he is called on the colonel. And he wore two orders. Two? I knew he was to receive the order of the sword on his retirement. But what can the other one be? I am not very familiar with these things, but there was a white cross within a red one. It is a Portuguese order, then. Let me see. Tell me, didn't his articles in that periodical deal with quarantine stations in Portuguese harbors? Yes, as far as I can recall. And he has never been in Portugal? Never. But I have been there. You shouldn't be so communicative. His ears and his memory are so good. Don't you think Judith may have helped him to this honor? <laughs> well, I declare. There are limits. Rising. And you have passed them. Are we to quarrel now? That depends on you. Don't meddle with my interests. If they cross my own, I have to meddle with them, although with a careful hand. Here he comes. And now it is going to happen. What is going to happen? We shall see. Let it come to open attack, then, for this state of siege is getting on my nerves. I have not a friend left on the island. Wait a minute. You sit on this side. He must have the easy chair, of course, and then I can prompt you. Captain enters from the background, in full-dress uniform, wearing the Order of the Sword and the Portuguese Order of Christ. Good day. Here's the meeting place. You are tired. Sit down. The captain, contrary to expectation, takes a seat on the sofa to the left. Make yourself comfortable. This is all right. You're too kind. Alice to Kurt. Be careful. He's suspicious of us. What was that you said? Alice to Kurt. He must have been drinking. No, he has not. Well, have you been amusing yourselves? And you? Are you looking at my orders? No. I guess not, because you are jealous. Otherwise, it is customary to offer congratulations to the recipient of honors. We congratulate you. We get things like these instead of laurel wreaths, such as they give to actresses. That's for the wreaths at home on the walls of the tower. Which your brother gave you. Oh, how you talk. Before which I have had to bow down these twenty-five years and which it has taken me twenty-five years to expose. You have seen my brother. Rather. Alice is crushed. And you, Kurt, you don't say anything, do you? I am waiting. Well, I suppose you know the big news? No. It is not exactly agreeable for me to be the one who— Oh, speak up. The soda factory has gone to the wall. That's decidedly unpleasant. Where does that leave you? Oh, I am all right, as I sold out in time. That was sensible. But how about you? Done for. It's your own fault. You should have sold out in time, or taken new stock. So that I could lose that, too. No, for then the company would have been all right. Not the company, but the directors, for in my mind that new subscription was simply a collection for the benefit of the board. And now I ask whether such a view of the matter will save your money. No, I shall have to give up everything. Everything? Even my home, the furniture. But that's dreadful. I have experienced worse things. That's what happens when amateurs want to speculate. You surprise me, for you know very well that if I had not subscribed, I should have been boycotted. The supplementary livelihood of the coast population, toilers of the sea, inexhaustible capital, inexhaustible as the sea itself, philanthropy and national prosperity, thus you wrote and printed, and now you speak of it as speculation. What are you going to do now? 
have an auction i suppose you had better what do you mean what i said for there are going to be some changes on the island yes as for instance your quarters are going to be exchanged for somewhat simpler ones well well yes plan is to place the quarantine station on the outside shore near the water my original idea i don't know about that for i am not familiar with your ideas on the subject however it seems then quite natural that you dispose of the furniture and it will attract much less notice what the scandal for it is a scandal to come to a new place and immediately get into financial troubles which must result in a lot of annoyance to the relatives particularly to the relatives oh i guess i'll have to bear the worst of it i'll tell you one thing my dear kurt if i had not stood by you in this matter you would have lost your position that too it comes rather hard for you to keep things in order complaints have been made against your work warranted complaints yeah for you are in spite of your other respectable qualities a careless fellow don't interrupt me you are a very careless fellow how strange however the suggested change is going to take place very soon and i should advise you to hold the auction at once or sell privately privately and where could i find a buyer in this place well i hope you don't expect me to settle down in the midst of your things i would make a fine story mm. especially when i think of what happened once upon a time what was that are you referring to what did not happen captain turning about you are so silent alice what is the matter old girl not blue i hope i sit here and think goodness are you thinking but you have to think quickly keenly and correctly if it is to be of any help so do your thinking now one two three ha ha you can't well then i must try where is judith somewhere where is alan where is the lieutenant i say kurt what are you going to do with alan now do with him yes you cannot afford to keep him in the artillery now perhaps not you had better get him into some cheap infantry regiment up in norland or somewhere in norland yes or suppose you turned him into something practical at once if i were in your place i should get him into some business office why not in these enlightened times yeah alice is so uncommonly silent yes children this is the seesawing seesaw aboard of life one moment high up looking boldly around and the next way down and then upward again and so on so much for that captain to alice did you say anything alice shakes her head we may expect company in a few days were you speaking to me we may expect company in a few days notable company who behold you're interested now you can sit there and guess who is coming and between guesses you may read this letter over again captain hands her an opened letter my letter opened back from the mail captain rising yes as the head of the family and your guardian i look after the sacred interests of the family and with iron hand i shall cut short every effort to break the family ties by means of criminal correspondence yah i am not dead you know but don't take offence now because i am going to raise us all out of undeserved humility undeserved on my part at least judith judith and holo fairness i perhaps pooh captain goes through the background who is that man 
How can I tell? We are beaten. Yes, beyond a doubt. He has stripped me of everything, but so cleverly that I can accuse him of nothing. Oh, why, no, you owe him a debt of gratitude instead. Does he know what he is doing? No, I don't think so. He follows his nature and his instincts, and just now he seems to be in favour where fortune and misfortune are being meted out. I suppose it's the Colonel who is to come here. Probably. And that is why Alan must go. And you find that right? Yes. Then our ways part. A little, but we shall come together again. Probably. And do you know where? Here. You guess it. That's easy. He takes the house and buys the furniture. I think so, too. But don't desert me. Not for a little thing like that. Goodbye. She goes. Goodbye. Curtain. Scene 3. Same stage setting, but the day is cloudy and it is raining outside. Alice and Kurt enter from the background, wearing raincoats and carrying umbrellas. Oh, at last I have got you to come here. But I cannot be so cruel as to wish you welcome to your own house. Oh, why not? I have passed through three forced sales, and worse than that, it doesn't matter to me. Did he call you? It was a formal command, but on what basis I don't understand. Why, he is not your superior. No, but he has made himself king of the island, and if there be any resistance, he has only to mention the colonel's name and everybody submits. Tell me, is it today the colonel is coming? He is expected, but I know nothing with certainty. Sit down, please. Kurt sitting down. Nothing has been changed here. Don't think of it. Don't renew the pain. The pain? I find it merely a little strange. Strange as the man himself. Do you know, when I made his acquaintance as a boy, I fled him. But he was after me. Flattered, offered services, and surrounded me with ties. I repeated my attempts at escape, but in vain. And now I am his slave. And why? He owes you a debt, but you appear as the debtor. Since I lost all I had, he has offered me help in getting Alan through his examinations. For which you will have to pay dearly. You are still a candidate for the Riksdag? Yes, and so far as I can see, there is nothing in my way. Is Alan really going to leave today? Yes, if I cannot prevent it. That was a short-lived happiness. Short-lived as everything but life itself, which lasts all too long. Too long, indeed. Won't you come in and wait in the sitting-room? Even if it does not trouble you, it troubles me, these surroundings. If you wish it. Oh, I feel ashamed. So ashamed that I wish I could die, but I can alter nothing. Let us go, then, as you wish it. And somebody is coming, too. They go out to the left. The captain and Alan enter from the background, both in uniform and wearing cloaks. Sit down, my boy, and let me have a talk with you. Captain sits down in the easy chair. Alan sits down on the chair to the left. It's raining today. Otherwise, I could sit here comfortably and look at the sea. Well, you don't like to go, do you? I don't like to leave my father. Yes, your father. He is rather an unfortunate man, and parents rarely understand the true welfare of their children. That is to say, there are exceptions, of course. Tell me, Alan, have you any communication with your mother? Yes, she writes now and then. Do you know that she is your guardian? Yes. Now, ah, Alan. Do you know that your mother has authorized me to act in her place? I didn't know that. Well, you know it now, and therefore all discussions concerning your career are done with, and you are going to Norland. But I have no money. I have arranged for what you need. Well, all I can do then is to thank you, Uncle. Yes, you are grateful, which everybody is not. The Colonel. Do you know the Colonel? No, I don't. The Colonel is my special friend. 
as you know perhaps the colonel has wished to show his interest in my family including my wife's relatives through his intercession the colonel has been able to provide the means needed for the completion of your course now you understand the obligation under which you and your father are placed toward the colonel have i spoken with sufficient plainness alan bows go and pack your things now the money will be handed to you at the landing and now good-bye my boy captain holds out a finger to alan good-bye then captain rises and goes out to the right alan alone stands still looking sadly around the room judith enters from the background wearing a hooded raincoat and carrying an umbrella otherwise exquisitely dressed in long skirt and with her hair put up is that you alan alan turning around surveys judith carefully is that you judith you don't know me any longer where have you been all this time what are you looking at my long dress and my hair you have not seen me like this before no do i look like a married woman alan turns away from her what are you doing here i'm saying goodbye what you are going away i'm transferred to norland to norland when are you going today whose doing is this your father's that's what i thought judith walks up and down the floor stamping her feet i wish you had stayed over today in order to meet the colonel what do you know about the colonel is it certain that you are going there's no other choice and now i want it myself why do you want it now i want to get away from here out into the world it's too close here yes alan i understand you it's unbearable here here where they speculate in soda and human beings as you know alan i possess that fortunate nature which cannot suffer but now i am learning you yes now it's beginning she presses both hands to her breast oh how it hurts oh what is it i don't know i choke i think i'm going to die judith oh is this the way it feels is this the way poor boys i should smile if i were as cruel as you are i am not cruel but i didn't know better you must not go i have to go then but give me a keepsake what have i to give you you no i can never live through this i suffer i suffer what have you done to me i don't want to live any longer alan don't go not alone let let us go together we'll take the small boat the little white one and we'll sail far out with the main sheet made fast the wind is high and we sail till we founder out there way out where there is no eel grass and no jellyfish what do you say but we should have washed the sails yesterday they should be white as snow for i want to see white in that moment and you swim with your arm about me until you grow tired and then we sink there would be style in that a good deal more style than in going about here lamenting and smuggling letters that will be opened and jeered at by father alan she takes hold of both his arms and shakes him do you hear alan who has been watching her with shining eyes judith judith why were you not like this before i didn't know how could i tell what i didn't know and now i must go away from you but i suppose it is the better the only thing i cannot compete with a man like don't speak of the colonel is it not true it is true and it is not true can it become wholly untrue yes so it shall within an hour a and you keep your word I, I can wait i can suffer i can work judith don't go yet how long must i wait a year one i shall wait a thousand years and if you do not come then i shall turn the dome of heaven upside down and make the sun rise in the west hush somebody is coming alan we must part take me into your arms they embrace each other but you must not kiss me she turns her head away there go now go now alan goes toward the background and puts on his cloak then they rush into each other's arms so that judith disappears beneath the cloak and for a moment they exchange kisses alan rushes out 
Judith throws herself face downward on the sofa and sobs. Alan comes back and kneels beside the sofa. No, I cannot go. I cannot go away from you. Not now. Judith rising. If you could only see how beautiful you are now. If you could only see yourself. Oh, no. A man cannot be beautiful. But you, Judith. You. That you. Oh, I saw that. When you were kind, another Judith appeared. And she's mine. But if you don't keep faith with me now, then I shall die. I think I am dying, even now. Oh, that I might die now, just now, when I am so happy. Somebody's coming. Let them come. I fear nothing in the world hereafter. But I wish you could take me along under your cloak. She hides herself in play under his cloak. And then I should fly with you to Norland. What are we to do in Norland? Become a fusilier? One of those that wear plumes on their hats? There's style in that, and it will be becoming to you. She plays with his hair. Alan kisses the tips of her fingers one by one, and then he kisses her shoe. What are you doing, Mr. Madcap? Your lips will get black. Rising impetuously. And then I cannot kiss you when you go. Come, and I'll go with you. No, then I should be placed under arrest. I'll go with you to the guard room. They wouldn't let you. We must part now. I'm going to swim after the steamer, and then you jump in and save me, and it gets into the newspapers and we become engaged. Shall we do that? You can still jest? There will always be time for tears. Say goodbye now. They rush into each other's arms. Then Alan withdraws slowly through the door in the background, Judith following him. The door remains open after them. They embrace again, outside in the rain. Oh, you'll get wet, Judith. What do I care? They tear themselves away from each other. Alan leaves. Judith remains behind, exposing herself to the rain and to the wind, which strains at her hair and her clothes while she is waving her handkerchief. Then Judith runs back into the room and throws herself on the sofa, with her face buried in her hands. Alice enters and goes over to Judith. What is this? Get up and let me look at you. Judith sits up. Alice scrutinizing her. You are not sick? And I am not going to console you. Alice goes out to the right. The lieutenant enters from the background. Judith gets up and puts on the hooded coat. Come along to the telegraph office, lieutenant. If I can be of service, but I don't think it's quite proper. So much the better. I want you to compromise me, but without any illusions on your part. Go ahead, please. They go out through the background. The captain and Alice enter from the right. He is in undress uniform. Captain sits down in the easy chair. Let him come in. Alice goes over to the door on the left and opens it, whereupon she sits down on the sofa. Kurt enters from the left. You want to speak to me? Yes. I have quite a number of important things to tell you. Sit down. Kurt sits down on the chair to the left. I am all ears. Well, then, you know that our quarantine system has been neglected during nearly a century. Alice to Kurt. That's the candidate for the Riksdag who speaks now. But with the tremendous development witnessed by our own day in... Alice to Kurt. The communications, of course. All kinds of ways. The government has begun to consider improvements. And for this purpose, the Board of Health has appointed inspectors. Alice to Kurt. He's giving dictation. You may as well learn it now as later. I have been appointed an inspector of quarantines. I congratulate and pay my respects to my superior at the same time. On account of ties of kinship, our personal relations will remain unchanged. However, to speak of other things, at my request your son Alan has been transferred to an infantry regiment in Norland. But I don't want it. Your will in this case is subordinate to the mother's wishes, and as the mother has authorized me to decide, I have formed this decision. I admire you. Is that the only feeling you experience at this moment, when you are to part from your son? Have you no other purely human feelings? You mean that I ought to be suffering? Yes. It would please you if I suffered. You wish me to suffer. You suffer? 
once I was taken sick, you were present, and I can still remember that your face expressed nothing but undisguised pleasure. That is not true. Kurt sat beside your bed all night and calmed you down when your qualms of conscience became too violent. But when you recovered, you ceased to be thankful for it. Captain, pretending not to hear Alice. Consequently, Alan will have to leave us. And who is going to pay for it? I have done so already. That is to say, we, a syndicate of people interested in the young man's future. A syndicate? Yes. And to make sure that everything is all right, you can look over these subscription lists. Captain hands him some papers. Lists? Reading the papers. These are begging letters? Call them what you please. Have you gone begging on behalf of my son? Are you ungrateful again? An ungrateful man is the heaviest burden borne by the earth. Then I am dead socially, and my candidacy is done for. What candidacy? For the Riksdag, of course. I hope you never had any such notions, particularly as you might have guessed that I, as an older resident, intended to offer my own services, which you seem to underestimate. Oh, well, then that's gone too. It doesn't seem to trouble you very much. Now you have taken everything. Do you want more? Have you anything more? And have you anything to reproach me with? Consider carefully if you have anything to reproach me with. Strictly speaking, no. Everything has been correct and legal as it should be between honest citizens in the course of daily life. You say this with a resignation which I would call cynical. But your entire nature has a cynical bent, my dear Kurt, and there are moments when I feel tempted to share Alice's opinion of you, that you are a hypocrite, a hypocrite of the first water. So that's Alice's opinion? Alice to Kurt. It was. Once. But not now, for it takes true heroism to bear what you have borne. Or it takes something else. Now I think the discussion may be regarded as closed. You, Kurt, had better go and say goodbye to Alan, who was leaving with the next boat. Kurt rising. So soon? Well, I have gone through worse things than that. You say that so often that I am beginning to wonder what you went through in America. What I went through? I went through misfortunes and it is the unmistakable right of every human being to suffer misfortune. There are self-inflicted misfortunes. Were yours of that kind? Is not this a question of conscience? Do you mean to say you have a conscience? There are wolves and there are sheep, and no human being is honored by being a sheep. But I'd rather be that than a wolf. You don't recognize the old truth that everybody is the maker of his own fortune. Is that a truth? And you don't know that a man's own strength— Yes, I know that from the night when your own strength failed you and you lay flat on the floor. A deserving man like myself. Yes, look at me. For fifty years I have fought against a world. But at last I have won the game by perseverance, loyalty, energy, and integrity. You should leave that to be said by others. The others won't say it, because they are jealous. However, we are expecting company. My daughter, Judith, will today meet her intended. Where is Judith? She is out. In the rain? Send for her. Perhaps I may go now? No, you had better stay. Is Judith dressed properly? Oh, so-so. Have you definite word from the colonel that he is coming? Captain Rising. Yes. That is to say, he will take us by surprise, as it is termed. And I am expecting a telegram from him any moment. He goes to the right. I'll be back at once. There you see him as he is. Can he be called human? When you asked that question once before, I answered no. Now I believe him to be the commonest kind of human being of the sort that possess the earth. Perhaps we too are of the same kind, making use of other people and of favorable opportunities. 
He has eaten you and yours alive, and you defend him? I have suffered worse things. And this man-eater has left my soul unharmed. That he couldn't swallow. What worse have you suffered? And you ask that? Do you wish to be rude? No, I don't wish to, and therefore don't ask again. Captain enters from the right. The telegram was already there, however. Please read it, Alice, for I cannot see. Read it. You need not go, Kurt. Alice glances through the telegram quickly and looks perplexed. Well, don't you find it pleasing? Alice stares in silence at the captain. Who is it from? From the colonel. So I thought. And what does the colonel say? This is what he says. On account of Miss Judith's impertinent communication over the telephone, I consider the relationship ended. Forever. Alice looks intently at the captain. Once more, if you please. On account of Miss Judith's impertinent communication over the telephone, I consider the relationship ended forever. It is Judith. And there is Holofernes. And what are you? Soon you will see. This is your doing. No. The captain tries to rise and draw his saber, but falls back, touched by an apoplectic stroke. There you got what was coming to you. Don't be angry at me. I am very sick. Are you? I am glad to hear it. Let us put him to bed. No, I don't want to touch him. Rings. You must not be angry at me. Captain to Kurt. Look after my children. This is sublime. I am to look after his children, and he has stolen mine. Always the same self-deception. Oh, at last that tongue is checked. Can brag no more, lie no more, wound no more. You, Kurt, who believe in God, give him thanks on my behalf. Thank him for my liberation from the tower, from the wolf, from the vampire. Not that way, Alice. Alice, with her face close to the captain's. Where is your own strength now? Tell me, where is your energy? The captain, speechless, spits in her face. Oh, you can still squirt venom, you viper. Then I'll tear the tongue out of your throat. She cuffs him on the ear. The head is off, but still it blushes. Oh, Judith, glorious girl, whom I have carried like vengeance under my heart. You, you have set us free, all of us. If you have more heads than one, Hydra will take them. She pulls his beard. Think only that justice exists on the earth. Sometimes I dreamed it, but I could never believe it. Kurt, ask God to pardon me for misjudging him. There is justice. So I will become a sheep, too. Tell him that, Kurt. A little success makes us better, but adversity alone turns us into wolves. The lieutenant enters from the background. The captain has had a stroke. Will you please help us to roll out the chair? Madame? What is it? Well... Miss Judith. Help us with this first, then you can speak of Miss Judith afterward. The lieutenant rolls out the chair to the right. Away with the carcass. Out with it. And let's open the doors. The place must be aired. Alice opens the door in the background. The sky is cleared. Ugh. Are you going to desert him? A wrecked ship is deserted, and the crew save their lives. I'll not act as undertaker to a rotting beast. Drain men and dissectors may dispose of him. A garden bed would be too good for that barrowful of filth. Now I am going to wash and bathe myself in order to get rid of all this impurity, if I can ever cleanse myself completely. Judith is seen outside, by the balustrade, waving her handkerchief toward the sea. Kurt toward the background. Who is there? Judith. Judith. He's gone. Who? Alan is gone. Without saying goodbye? He did to me, and he sent his love to you, Uncle. Oh, that was it? Judith throwing herself into Kurt's arms. He is gone. He will come back, little girl. Or we will go after him. Kurt with a gesture indicating the door on the right. And leave him? What would the world... The world? Bah, Judith, come into my arms. Judith goes up to Alice, who kisses her on the forehead. Do you want to go after him? How can you ask? 
But your father is sick. What do I care? Oh, this is Judith. Oh, I love you, Judith. And besides, Papa is never mean, and he doesn't like cuddling. There's style to Papa, after all. Yes, in a way. And I don't think he is longing for me after that telephone message. Well, why should he pester me with an old fellow? No, Alan, Alan! Judith throws herself into Kurt's arms. I want to go to Alan! She tears herself loose again and runs out to wave her handkerchief. Kurt follows her and waves his handkerchief also. Think of it. That flowers can grow out of dirt. The lieutenant in from the right. Well? Yes. Miss Judith. Is the feeling of those letters that form her name so sweet on your lips that it makes you forget him who is dying? Yes, but she said— She? Say rather Judith, then. But first of all, how goes it in there? Oh. In there? It's all over. All over? Oh, God. On my own behalf and that of all mankind, I thank thee for having freed us from this evil. Oh, your arm, if you please. I want to go outside and get a breath. Oh, breathe. The lieutenant offers his arm. Alice checks herself. Did he say anything before the end came? Miss Judith's father spoke a few words only. What did he say? He said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Inconceivable. Yes, Miss Judith's father was a good and noble man. Kurt. Kurt enters. It is over. Oh. Do you know what his last words were? <laughs> no, you can never guess it. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can you translate it? I suppose he meant that he had always done right and died as one that had been wronged by life. I am sure his funeral sermon will be fine. And plenty of flowers from the non-commissioned officers. Yes. About a year ago he said something like this. It looks to me as if life were a tremendous hoax played on all of us. Do you mean to imply that he was playing a hoax on us up to the very moment of death? No, but now when he is dead, I feel a strange inclination to speak well of him. Well, let us do so. Miss Judith's father was a good and noble man. Listen to that. They know not what they do. How many times did I not ask you whether he knew what he was doing, and you didn't think he knew? Therefore, forgive him. Riddles. Riddles. But do you notice that there is peace in the house now? The wonderful peace of death. Wonderful as the solemn anxiety that surrounds the coming of a child into the world. I hear the silence, and on the floor I see the traces of the easy chair that carried him away. And I feel now that my own life is ended, and I am starting on the road to dissolution. Do you know, it's queer, but those simple words of the lieutenant, and his is a simple mind, they pursue me, but now they have become serious. My husband, my youth's beloved. Yes, perhaps you laugh. He was a good and noble man. Nevertheless. Nevertheless? And a brave one, as he fought for his own and his family's existence. What worries, what humiliations, which he wiped out in order to pass on. He was one who had been passed by. And that is to say much. Alice, go in there. No, I cannot do it. For while we have been talking here, the image of him as he was in his younger years has come back to me. I have seen him. I see him. Now, as when he was only twenty. I must have loved that man. And hated him. And hated. Peace be with him. Alice goes toward the right door and stops in front of it, folding her hands as if to pray. Curtain End of the Dance of Death by August Stringberg Translated by Edward Bjorkman